Hello and welcome to Calm Versations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's Calm Versant is Bo Dade, otherwise known as History Bro on Lotus, LotusEaters.com and YouTube as well. And as you might tell from his nom de plume, he is somewhat a student of history. He's been on the channel several times before, and we've covered a lot of different aspects of the founding in the early years of the United States of America. And in this conversation, we cover in great detail the life of Alexander Hamilton, who's a intellectual powerhouse and one of the central figures of the founding of the United States of America. And in this conversation, and also especially in the conversation previously with Bo about Thomas Jefferson, I see and I learn a lot about the DNA of the United States of America and how it acted then and how the decisions made by our founding fathers lead to the situations that we are in, right? Now, if you are interested in more Bo, definitely check out the links in the description. Without further ado, here is History Bro and I going at it over Alexander Hamilton. I would say he's one of the most important founding fathers who wasn't president. Because a lot of them, like four, four or five of them became president. John Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. They all had a shot at being president. <clears throat> a couple of the big ones didn't. Benjamin Franklin was a bit too old. Um, John Did he Jay. want to? Do we know if Benjamin Franklin? Even, yeah, Franklin. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think so. No, I don't think he ever expressed. I don't think it was ever really on the cards for him. He was always the elder statesman. Um, but yeah, Hamilton could have been, if things had played out differently, could have been president, but never was. Uh, and yet, having said that, he is, it's no ex exaggeration to say, one of the most crucial players in the whole thing. America as it is today is really a reflection of what Hamilton wanted, much more than Jefferson, because we'll get into all this when we go into the details, but he had a basically uh, a type of political war with Jefferson and lost, basically. Um, and, yet, <clears throat> and yet, America as it is today is not really a reflection. Well, it's much more a reflection of Hamilton's view than it is of Jefferson's. Jefferson wanted uh, states to have a lot more power than they do, and they're to be sort of very rural and uh, agrarian and uh, a tiny state. Mm -hmm. um, and Hamilton wanted a sort of an all-powerful centralised federal government uh, with lots of industry, uh, lots of sort of higher finance, and, and, uh, oh, and a standing army and navy. Mm -hmm. Jefferson didn't, people like Jefferson and John Adams didn't want that. And so, like I say, ultimately... Yeah. You could say Hamilton won in the end. Yeah. Um, but his life is, to give it a tiny bit of quick overview, it's a really, really remarkable life. <laughs> it's really remarkable. It's incredible the things he did and went through. Um, I've seen some people say, you know, if it was a novel, it would be sort of barely believable <laughs> that you keep putting the same character at the centre of events over and over and over again and um, sort of risking his life... <laughs> daring do on the battlefield yeah. all sorts of things kind of like a, uh, a forrest gump with a few uh, more iq points kind of just always <laughs> just right there yeah an 18th century forrest gump that's quite a good that's quite a good analogy actually <laughs> I, quite, I quite like that yeah i mean he's the guy for people who might not know he's the guy on your 10 dollar bill that's the face of alexander hamilton there and um i mean also to start he was he's there's a little church the Trinity Church, and it's just behind Broadway and Wall Street in New York, where he's buried. And he is sort of, in all sorts of ways, Mr. New York. Um, he was very, very closely connected with New York in all sorts of different ways. Hmm. But he wasn't born in the United States, or the 13 colonies as it was when he was born in the 1850s. Uh, he was born in the West Indies, a little island called Nevis, which uh, is controlled by the British, even to that, to, to that today. Um, and he was, he was illegitimate, a bastard. Hmm. Now, that doesn't really mean much these days. I myself happen to be a bastard. Oh. All that means is your mum and dad weren't married. Yeah. So that is, my mum and dad never married, so therefore I'm a bastard. Now, if your family hasn't got a lot of money and a state to pass down to you, or the eldest child, as it would be, it doesn't make any difference. Um, but back then, it made all the difference. It made a world of difference. If you were a bastard, it meant loads of things. It meant like you couldn't have a formal church education, for example. 
-hmm. It meant you had no inheritance rights. Even if your mother or father had lots of money, you weren't legally uh, allowed to inherit it. It was all sorts of things. And, of course, the main thing probably is just the stigma. You'd carry around that stigma with you your whole life. Hmm. That there's something, something unholy about your, about your birth, about your whole life. Mm-hmm. It's something, it's not sort of correctly ordained. Mm. You know, it's that bad. Um, huh. So, and he had that chip on his shoulder his, his whole life. Is yeah. To say. I, yeah. Well, I, that would be the question. To what extent did that um, leak into his ideology, that kind of perspective? And then how does that inform his input into the culture or the identity of America? Kind of this bastard nation, right? <laughs> Right, yeah, absolutely. I mean, questioning legitimacy, outsider, I mean, like deeply questioning legitimacy. Well, one of the things I meant we mentioned in the in the Jefferson conversation we had is that these guys, before the United States was sort of constituted, they would consider their state to be their country. So, like Jefferson considered himself a Virginia man. You know, John Adams thought that Massachusetts was his country, right? And all these guys had a very strong connection to their state they would call it their country um and so hamilton didn't have that yeah he was essentially an immigrant he was an immigrant um and so yeah this this outsider thing always he always carried it around with him i think Mm -hmm. he always had something to prove i mean he was unbelievably industrious he was extremely hard working he was that type of person that just never ever stopped and it was sort of and nothing was enough for him in a way. I don't mean that in a particularly disparaging way, but just, you know, he would reach high office and he wouldn't stop. He would dial up his efforts, if if anything. Mm-hmm. He was one of those types of people. Um, I know for a fact I'd be one of those people that if I won the lottery, if I somehow, you know, spent 10 years and made a few million pounds, I'd be, I'd be happy to sit back, kick back in my mansions mm-hmm. on an island somewhere and not really work very hard for the last few years of my life. I'd be happy to do that. But, you know, some people aren't like that. They sort of can't stop. It's sort of deep down in their bones to always be pushing as hard as they can. Uh, people have described him that he's the type of person that would like to dominate a room, not in a really uh, sort of, you know, physical way, but he sort of needed to be the smartest person in the room. Mm-hmm. And when it came to women, he loved the women's. He loved women folk. He got himself in trouble with that. We'll get into that in a minute. But he loved to flirt with women and be loved by women. And he loved to dominate intellectually everyone around him uh, politically. He had to be the best. He was that sort of character. Um, and so, to be fair, not all that likable. Hmm. As um, opposed to Jefferson, which you said in our last conversation was more like held back, didn't openly dispute people. It was very more reserved. Some people have described it as a type of uh, sort of social finesse. On Um, Jefferson's part. Yeah. If you, and all of, most of the founding fathers, nearly all of them, really, they were that type that uh, was sort of born to money and or land and were, it's not the right word, but middle class, if not upper class. And so you were raised in sort of a, a social milieu where you're raised to have manners um, for want of a better expression. And not um, be a cheeky you had bastard. A, yeah. Right. That you'd have finesse. Um, that, you know, politics is the art of compromise. There's lots of ways to describe really what the, what the art, what, 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 what politics is. But one of the things is to, to be able to persuade people of things and, um, and to be able to coerce people without them really appreciating that they're being coerced okay Mm -hmm. now jefferson was a master of that um he was extremely likable it seemed and i said in the in in the jefferson conversation we had if you didn't have a reason to hate jefferson you'd probably love him you'd probably love to be in his company he was extremely charming he was extremely witty hamilton wasn't charming he was like a bull in a china shop he would just say exactly what he meant at all times And if you didn't like it, you could lump it. Hmm. And it's as simple as that. He was that type, you know. So um, some people uh, really liked it, found it endearing, but many didn't. Because that sort of person, you might respect them or have have uh, have no choice but to respect them, but you might not like them. In fact, you might even fear them. 
fear isn't a good thing in, in politics, in sort of open, free politics. Um, you're, it's probably just going to garner you enemies. Um, and, and is that what happened so, with Hamilton? Hamilton made over his career lots and lots and lots of enemies because uh-huh. he wouldn't compromise. That was the other thing. He was very, very principled. All these men are very principled. But the other thing we said about Jefferson is that he was a master of compromise. That's another thing you could say about politics. It's the art of compromise. Whenever you get involved in politics, party politics, you're going to have to compromise. You're never going to get everything you want. You're probably not going to get everything you want unless you become some sort of uh, absolute autocrat. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, You're going to have to compromise. And Jefferson was a master of that. Hamilton wasn't really a master of that. It Mm -hmm. It was his way or the highway. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was his rules or nothing at all. Yeah. Well, doesn't um, that kind of speak or foreshadow uh, their perspectives on Jefferson thinks that these states can kind of get along and compromise with each other. And Hamilton thinks that a, a centralized authority should be able to articulate the will of the country. Mm. No, exactly that. It, it, it plays out exactly like that. Um, so, I mean, we'll get into their disputes their sort of political disputes when it comes up, if I could run through his life sort of chronologically. Yeah. 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 Where, where do you want to start? So, of, so he's born a bastard full, on an Island. Yeah. Yeah. If we do a sort of, full, a sort of a full biography of him. So yeah. So he's born on this really tiny little Island in the West Indies and he's born to his mother who was divorced. So she'd already been married and then she divorced. I believe her first husband might have been abusive or he probably was abusive or Possibly she cheated on him. We don't know. Either way, it fell apart. A lot of these things in the 18th century, you do have to say, if you're going to be completely honest, we don't know. So, for example, we're not 100% sure which year Hamilton was born, whether it was 1755 or 1757, because a bit later in his life, he he probably lied about his birth to appear younger than he was. And I'll tell mm. you about that when we get to it, when he gets to New York and enrolls in college, as you guys call it. Um, so, anyway, he's born on Nevis. And... Um, and his father, uh, was it James, James Hamilton, I think it was, uh, was uh, a younger son of uh, a Scottish nobleman. Now, younger sons, as we mentioned earlier about uh, eldest sons inheriting, the eldest son gets everything. That's primogeniture. The younger sons sort of just have to go and make their way in the world. Quite often join the army or join the clergy. Either way, have to have to make their way in the world hopefully won't have too many children that the eldest son then has to take care of upon his death. Anyway, Mm -hmm. Hamilton's father was the younger son of of someone quite important in Scotland. And they had an estate called the Grange, if I recall correctly. But so he had to make his way in the world. He tried to make his way by making, having a small holding in um, some plantations on Nevis, sort of a sugar, was it sugar? They make on Nevis, I think it was mainly sugar and coffee. And he tried to make a go of it and failed. He was a failure really at that. So his family had no real money. And when Hamilton, he ha- Hamilton also had a younger brother. When he was about 10, his father left. His father, who had never married his mother, like I say, left, left them. Um, so that leaves Hamilton and his younger brother and his mother in a bit of a, you know, a, bit of a sticky spot. They're, they're a bit of a sticky wicket now because she's divorced. And then her second protector, if you like, has left her. And she's got these two boys. Uh, they moved to sorry. They moved to another island, Saint Croix, again in the West Indies, to try and make another go of it. And they just struggled. Like she, they they weren't in complete penury. They weren't didn't, they weren't in absolute poverty, but they didn't have much money. Mm-hmm. And she did sewing and things. They had a few bits of furniture, a few sticks of furniture, quite a few books actually. Mm. That will become important in a moment. Okay. Uh, but but sort sort of struggling, sort of struggling. Um, but you know, right on, but not sort of. Not, not going hungry, but quite poor. When he's 13, his mother gets yellow fever and dies. And so he's left alone in the world, almost, very nearly. Uh, now, he actually got yellow fever as well at the same time. And they were placed in the same bed. They only had sort of one bedroom. And he sort of suffered with yellow fever in the same bed with his mother, mm. dying of yellow fever. And she dies next to him. Now, can you imagine? You're 13 and you're already in a very difficult social and sort of monetary situation. And the only person that can really, well, is your only guardian. 
goes ahead and dies on you and you witness it. You're like, I mean, it must have been an unbelievably traumatic event. Unbelievable, especially at 13. You're like old enough to know what's going on. You're not like a little kid and you're not an adult. We can deal with it in an adult with adult emotions and adult rationality. You're 13. But I can't imagine hmm. sort of the trauma of that. But that's what happened. And so he's, he's sort of left alone. Now, the first husband takes everything. He's legally allowed to, so he does. And he's left with nothing. They leave him the books, fairly big book collection. I think a few hundred odd books, which isn't nothing because books are a lot more valuable back then than they are now. But still, essentially nothing. No estate, no, no lump sum or anything. Mm -hmm. He is given over to the guardianship of an uncle. He's got one uncle. So he and his little brother are given over to this uncle. And about a year later, that uncle commits suicide. Well. Oh. So in the space of a few years there, from about the age of 10 to about the age of 14, Alexander Hamilton suffers just a number of devastating losses. Right? Now, that, we talked about him having a chip on his shoulder. No wonder. Yeah. Right. No wonder. I mean, he's got something to prove big time. He's got to. He's got no choice but to try and prove himself. He's now this 14 year old in the West Indies with sort of no one to look out for him and his younger brother. And um, well, the only thing he's got going for him is his intelligence. He is very precociously intelligent. I mean, teaches himself fluent French, mm. um, reads these books, a voracious reader read everything basically and some of the classics some of my favorites actually things like plutarch and livy some of the roman historians mm -hmm. learning about history learning about the world of men learning how the world ticks learning learning about politics history and everything so that is a good grounding uh, but that's all he had going for him this sort of very firm grounding in letters and and uh, a rapier like intellect mm -hmm. And it seems to have um, it seems to have held him in good stead because uh, he was sort of not exactly adopted, but a, a, a friend of the family, who some say might have been his illegitimate father, sort of looked out for him and got him a role in a, in a, a trading company when he was about fifteen. He gets a job in a, in a company. I was fourteen still. A, a, a company called Beekman and Kruger. That's the name of the company. Now they were traders in the West Indies out of New York, or was it Boston? I believe New York. But they're a trading company. And he was given a fairly senior position straight off the bat because he can read and write very well, not just read and write, but very, very well to an extremely high standard, considering he's had no formal education, really. Um, so he's given this position as some type of clerk. But quite quickly, again, within a year or so, sort of the main man, Kruger, <laughs> Uh, he's taken ill. I don't think he actually dies. But he's taken ill for a long time, sort of nine months. And Hamilton's left to sort of hold the fort down, to sort of do everything. So by the time he's 15, he's sort of ordering around adults. He's sort of telling adults what the deal is. Hmm. <laughs> he's sort of telling them yes or no on things. And holding firm, you know, with sort of these hard-bitten atlantic captains sea captains hmm. you know he's telling them what the prices of things are i mean he has to learn all about currencies there's many many different currencies he'd have to learn the 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 the, the trade of shipping he was an, an evaluator an appraiser uh, he learns really international trade uh, at, at a very young age and can completely handle himself he can handle it that sort of job that sort of role might break a lot of adults it's, it's like quite a lot to take on yeah and he sort of manages it with, with a plum and well that says doesn't it that you're you've got a, a strong character yeah. you've got a very strong character if you're able to do that um oh, one other thing to say um is that he's he sees sort of maybe of course slavery firsthand now there's slavery there's all sorts of types of slavery in the world over time and the type of slavery in the South, in the plantations in the United States, was a pretty brutal version of slavery. Uh, but on those islands, on those West Indian islands, it's even more brutal, if anything. Okay. People, are, the life uh, is very, very cheap. Very, very cheap. Um, so that's something to mention because he was sort of staunchly anti-slavery later in his life. 
Um, Did he so own or control oh, slaves? No. no, 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 not at all. No, like I say, he's this fifteen-year-old kid with no, no estate, no money. Okay. Nothing. I and mean, he's earning some. By money. the way, how does this company do under his watch? Yeah, very well. Yeah, yeah. no, fine, absolutely okay. well. He's able to, <laughs> he's able to do the job that has been assigned to him. Um, you know, just telling people, um, you know, what he's going to buy and sell their goods for, keeps keeps the books um, completely perfectly, just everything. Um, yeah, he's he's capable, he's competent. You know, straight off the bat from a fifteen-year-old. Yeah. Um, so that is quite remarkable, really. Yeah. But he did, he did, uh, like I say, have this. I don't want to keep saying it, but a chip on his shoulder. It's more than that, really. It's sort of a burning fire deep down in his belly, deep down in his gut, that he wants to be more. He wants to do more. He doesn't want to just be, um, uh, you know, stuck on this island for his whole life. Like I say, he's read Plutarch, the lives of Plutarch, the great men of some of the great men from the ancient world. He wants to be one of them. He dreams of being um, a great warrior on the battlefield. He dreams of being a statesman. Of, of being at the top of politics, all, the, all that sort of thing. So being a, even a, a, an accomplished clerk for a trading company on St. Croix, it's not enough for him. Mm -hmm. um, and this is early and so 1770s. He's got a burning 70s, ambition. Though, that he's, he's in charge. He's yes. starting to make connections with people offside, uh, uh, beyond the island. He's, he's getting connected to all these shipping magnates, and that probably starts the connections with the continent. Well, that's right. Yeah, he hasn't got any strong connections with mainland United States yet. Although, again, it's not the United States. But yeah, we're talking the 1770s, very early 1770s. Okay. Um, so one thing that happens, actually, I've got a quote here. He wrote to a friend around this time when he was about 17 years old. He said, quote, to confess my weakness, my ambition is so prevalent that I disdain the groveling conditions of a clerk to which my fortune condemns me. I would willingly risk my life, though not my character, to exalt my station. My folly makes me ashamed, yet we know that such schemes can triumph if the schemer is resolute. Oh, how I wish there was a war. Hmm. Now, what I think to say, that's one of his most famous lines, because people always hark back to it, where he said, I would willingly risk my life, though not my character, to exalt my station, to become something bigger and better. Well, he did exactly that. He actually did do exactly that. Because a lot of people would say, I think a lot of people probably, you know, uh, when there's nothing really at risk, they'd say, "Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd fight on the front lines, or, or I'd, I'd risk my reputation or even my life if it meant I could be someone very important in the world." And most people don't really seek it out. In the end, they don't mm. really put everything on the line. Well, he did. He read, yeah. so he really meant that when he said that. Okay. Uh, yeah. But you know, oh, how I wish there was a war. Yeah. Quite alien to us in this day and age. Well, I mean, with the hmm. experience of the two world wars, most people wouldn't say something like that. Yeah. But it was different well, in the 18th century. It's interesting. I, you just make me think. Like, there, there's people who won't even say that that they would risk their lives, but they'll put a Ukrainian flag in their bio, right? Like, they'll they'll support the good side, but they won't go and fight. You know. So, but he'd rather go and fight. He he he's hungering for a milieu to prove himself. And in that day and that age and that mindset, war is where a man is proved. No, absolutely. He, again, he read the, the stories of sort of great men from history, realized that one of the ways you can earn fame, and I don't mean fame in our sense, like being internet famous or mm -hmm. getting on, or getting on uh, Britain's Got Talent or something like that, but true fame, fame immemorial, Mm -hmm. To be to become one of the great men of history, that your name will echo through the ages. That's what he wanted. Okay. That's what he wanted more than anything else. And he was prepared to, um, you know, work extremely hard to to achieve that. Um, so one of the one of his other talents was to be able to write. At one point, when he was about, I think, sixteen or seventeen, a a, a great um, gale. A storm, a huge storm, came through the West Indies. Uh, one of the biggest storms for many, many generations. One of the biggest we know of, and it sort of, kind of devastated the West Indies a bit. And anyway, hmm. he wrote a piece about that, describing it, and it got published in one of the local papers. And it was, it was so eloquent, it was sort of so well done, that people took notice of it. They realised, oh wait, this kid. This kid is like some sort of um, 
prodigy, some sort of genius, some sort of master of words. Um, <laughs> so, and, and then after that, he wrote a few more poems and a few more bits and pieces that got published. And people on the island sort of realised that he was really something quite special. Okay. And so on the strength of that, there was sort of a, a whip round for him. They got together a, a bit of money to pay for his crossing to mainland America and to get him a scholarship in one of the better schools. Um, it happened to be in New, in New York. Okay, so already at, at this College, time, sorry. already at this time, uh, America, what would become the United States of America is kind of basically the cultural stronghold for the Europeans. It's, it's already established. It's got colleges. It's the place that you go to get educated. You send your kids either to England or, barring that, the United States, New York, a few other places. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you could. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, uh, the 13 colonies, I can't call it the United States yet. We'll get into that. But the 13 colonies are, of course, for an English speaker, um, sort of um, the, the, the center of everything. That's where trade, you know, New Orleans and New York uh, – the Hudson, the where some of these big rivers uh, flow out into the sea, hmm. um, the Mississippi at New Orleans. Uh, these are the hubs of commerce, and thus cities grow up around them. Hmm. Uh, and yes, yeah, so, so like Boston, and New York, Charleston, New Orleans, yeah. these are the biggest cities. You know, so um, just to say again, because we said it in the in the in the in the Jefferson one, but. What was to become the United States, which at this point still the 13 colonies, don't stretch very far into continental America. They're yes. still really all on the East Coast, um, basically. Um, but yeah, so they have a whip round for him. They send him to King's College in New York, which becomes Columbia University. What is today Columbia University it used to be called King's College. Mm. And they send him there. And that's where he lied. He was already... A, a bit too a little bit too old not too old but a bit too old like he was 18 by this point and usually if you were going to go to college in those days you would do it already you'd probably start when you're about 14 or 15 mm -hmm. not 18 so it's not like unheard of unprecedented but it's a touch too old so it looks like he probably lied about his birth year um so that's the that's the story of that but immediately again he's sort of very very, very, very strong work ethic and sort of undeniable talent um, is just sort of immediately on show. Um, and um, he's accepted into sort of uh, the circles at, at King's College. Hmm. And he, he, he meets straight away some of the people that are sort of become important in his life. In fact, he crosses paths with one Mr. Aaron Burr, who's a few years older than him, I believe, um, at King's College. Um, but he, he sort of gets connections quite quickly in New York. Could you gloss um, what kind of circles there are, like where, where the seats of power or society, are like what, what, what were their masks? They didn't have postmodern, um, you know, literary departments right now. So there's seminaries, um, what lawyers, I guess, a lot of law, law that's where uh, power is concentrated. That's where a young, ambitious man would insert himself. Well, well, yeah, but not to begin with. So the way it has always been for centuries and centuries in the English speaking world is that the foundation of a first class education is your Latin and Greek. Yes. You must, you must master Latin and Greek, <laughs> particularly Latin. Um, that's the foundation. So, and he was a great linguist. Like I say, he taught himself French and he was obviously brilliant uh, 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 English. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, he taught him. So he, he got up to he got up to snuff very quickly with his Latin and Greek. Now, if you're able to do that, like I say, that's the foundation. From there, you can go on to other things, okay. whether it's medicine or law, or or, any, or anything else really. Um, and so, but he's he's only really does that for a few years, a couple of years, before events sort of overtake his his sort of burgeoning education. Um, because there are the events of the the Revolutionary War, the War of so Independence. So he gets the oh the war that he's pining for, right? Yeah. And one thing that you can say about wars is that if you get lucky, if you're in the right place at the right time, um, it can sort of catapult you up the ladder 
if you like you can get you can go from nobody to somebody very important to nobility um hmm. yeah so i mean he lands in new york in uh, 1773 and already the colonies are in a, a type of turmoil perhaps turmoil is a bit too strong but already there's factions you asked about um what the different circles are well there are of course uh, the circles that are to do with sort of wealth and um trade and commerce yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's probably i think the two most important ones are whether you were a patriot or a loyalist i.e are you loyal a loyalist are loyal to parliament and england and the crown mm -hmm. and if you're a patriot you're sort of for independence although i did go into quite a lot of detail last time about how independence was much much later down the line yes. true independence uh i won't go into that too much here but needless to say there were those that thought things like the Stamp Act and, uh, and uh, various other taxations on the colonies as, as uh, dictated by Parliament back in Westminster. Um, there were those that thought that was sort of reasonable and those that thought it was completely unreasonable, that they, there should be no taxation without representation. Um, now, quite quickly, to begin with, well, to begin with, at the very, very beginning of his life as a child, he was just sort of unquestionably a loyalist. But once he's in New York, very quickly, he becomes um, a patriot. Um, very, almost straight away, really, he decides um, that, no, it is unfair. It is a type of tyranny that hmm. the Crown of England and Parliament are trying to stamp on Americans who really should be entirely free from such well, things. Was some of his reasoning behind that decision? Well, he just thought that, well, exactly that. It's about liberty. It's about freedom. I've got a quote here. Okay. He wrote in a pamphlet, because, it, as I mentioned, he's a great writer. He's, he's a superb wordsmith. <laughs> um, in one, he, he started writing pamphlets. I remember this is like an 18, 19-year-old kid, really. A bit patronising to call him a kid, but he's still basically a kid. But he starts writing political pamphlets, uh, polemics. Um, What's and his in pen one, names? One of them, here's a great quote. The, Sorry, there were a bunch of frog and nons back then. Yeah, like loads of nons. Yeah, yeah. He what used loads. I haven't name? got any off the top of my head. Okay, well, he would yeah. have used all sorts of different ones. Yeah, yeah. they quite often used ones from uh, the ancient world, like they call themselves Brutus or something. Yeah. Um, but I can't remember uh, which ones he used. But in one pamphlet, which is a great quote, gives you a, an idea of his thinking. He said, "This man is either either governed by his own laws, freedom, or." the laws of another slavery are you willing he's talking to the public now the, the the american public are you willing to become slaves will you give up your freedom your life and your prop and your property without a single struggle no man has a right to rule over his fellow creatures it is incontestable that americans are entitled to freedom mm. And, and that, yet, that was his thinking. That's where he was coming from. And yet he later on down the road, he's for centralized government. He's for centralized <laughs> control. That's just a contradiction. Well, yeah, we, on some levels. Yeah. He wanted mm -hmm. men to be free, but he wanted order. <clears throat> One of the things that he despised was anarchy and mob rule. So one anecdote uh, was perfect to say right now. One anecdote at one point, uh, a mob turns up, uh, a patriotic mob turns up at the gates of King's College and they want to tar and feather and probably assault, probably not murder, but assault and tar and feather. Um, the uh, One of the leading lights in, in King's College, um, um, Cooper, I believe his name was, um, and Hamilton stands on the, the steps and argues with this rabble with a mob he argues with them saying look i agree with you but we must have law and order you're, you're going to disgrace the uh, you're going to disgrace the uh, our 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 calls for liberty and freedom if you go around doing this thing if you start acting beyond mm. the law mm -hmm. you know let's have law first okay. and foremost yeah um so yeah and he had like i mentioned he had principles yeah. And uh, he stuck by them regardless. I mean, that's very brave as a sort of 18, 19 year old to 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 sort of stare down a mob. He had his Jordan um, Peterson moment, you know, in 2015, <laughs> Jordan Peterson arguing yeah. with the Tranty Fuzz. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted an honorable revolution. OK, that's what he wanted. Yeah. Um, so um, 
well, so to carry on, he, he decides what he's going to do. Is he's going to sort of abandon his study and join the army because that's one of the things he always wanted. He wanted okay. to be a, a hero. A so hero. army, what, which army, what's this army standing army? Like, what does that mean? Like who is the army who holds the armies at this point? Right, so I've jumped ahead a few years there, so we're going to have to montage through a fair bit of this because there's lots okay. of stories I could tell about how he gives speeches. He starts giving speeches in public about the cause and about liberty. Okay. Um, there was a, a, a giant pole erected in one of the parks right near Columbia, uh, the Liberty Pole, where people would congregate, and he gave speeches and was convincing and things. Apparently, in fact, that's one of the story. quick anecdote I'll say, is that he, start, he sort of impromptu gave a speech and again, everyone was like, who is this brilliant kid? <laughs> who is he? We love him. Like, obviously, if you agree with his political view, he's great. Yeah. Like, we, he, he's he's going to be one of our leaders in the future. Okay. Sort of, no one really sort of seemed to deny that. So, he's but some, some sort of genius. This cause for liberty hasn't coalesced yet. So it's kind of, it's, it, it's an open call for some form of independence, but they're not calling it independence. Do they have like a, does his group, does his mindset, does he have like an idea of what they're actually asking for other than loosen restrictions? Uh, you know, do, do, that idea is there is a really seminal idea. And this is also in the shadow of the enlightenment, right? So these ideas are, mm. are percolating up through percolating up through the Anglophone uh, society. Mm. And, and yeah. Okay. So yeah. the, the process is over a few years. So the full call for independence, full independence from the crown isn't until well into 1776, really some people are calling for it years before, but not many. Yeah, okay. Most of them are just saying, we don't want uh, British troops to... Well, so, okay, you've got the Boston Tea Party and the Boston Massacre. And a lot of American, a lot of patriots are saying, look, we, we're not going to stand for the British troops, um, you know, hold, literally holding us to gunpoint sometimes to do their bidding. We're not going to have that. We don't necessarily... We still consider ourselves, uh, you know, uh, true subjects of King George... Mm -hmm. But we're not going to have that, though. We're not going to accept your taxation, and we're not going to accept the army in Boston, in New York, um, you know, uh, telling us what we can or cannot trade, yes. that sort of thing. So, yeah, the call for full independence isn't until quite near the Declaration of Independence. Okay. Ag again, there's, there's so many people and, and characters here. Yeah. Some are calling yeah. for it earlier, but yeah. anyway. By the time of Lexington and Concord, when the people up in Massachusetts start having gun battles with the with the with the British army, by that point Hamilton's in the army, I believe. So it would have started as a like the New York militia. But by the time the Continental Congress in in uh, Philadelphia put General Washington in charge of the army, Hamilton's in the army. Okay. So now he's a, he's, the army of sorry. what? The army of the colonies, the colonial army? Do, do they have a name? Like, what are they an army for? Yeah, the, 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 the Continental Army. That's okay. what it's called. Okay. The Continental Army. Um, and, and they put, they, they give George Washington, a, a, a Virginia man, the, uh, the, the command. And uh, he, uh, well, uh, Hamilton's an, an artilleryman. And the thing about artillery is that you can't fake it. You can't sort of... Uh, you have to know what you're doing. You have to be good at maths. You have to be good at numbers to sort of calculate arcs and things. So by um, artil ar ar artillery, we're talking about cannons at this yes, point. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, like that's exactly it, yeah. Okay. So to be uh, an infantryman, you just need to... Be, if you're in the ranks, anyway, you just need to be able to do as you're told. A bit like Forrest Gump, again. Um, if you can take orders, you'll fit right in. If you don't question what your orders are, that's sort of the main prerequisite mm -hmm. to be in the cavalry. If you can ride well, that's sort of the main thing. You don't need to be good at maths or anything, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You don't need to be competent and have everything squared away at all times. Now, to be an artillery officer, and he was an officer, um, you, you, need to, you need to be competent, Right. You could get away with being a grunt in the infantry and not being all that competent, but not if you're an officer in the artillery. Yeah. Um, and so, again, once again, he proves that he is totally capable. He's competent. Um, now, very quickly after the, the 
the the war starts after the Declaration of Independence. Um, so again, he's still he's one of the youngest founding fathers to point that out. He's the youngest one at this point in 1776. He's still young. What is he? 21 or something? 22. Or could something. we could we um, um, reapproach yeah. 1776? Like, how does he insert sure. himself into the circle of people who would end up? founding america like how does he get connected so he joins the right, army yeah. he's an uh, artilleryman he's an officer so he's hobnobbing with people his his personality has got to be coming out too like maybe he's being a little insubordinate but he's competent so there's a calculation well do we keep him around like are there any stories about how he works his way up through the army into the seat of power yeah exactly yeah absolutely he does it through washington himself so what happens is he is uh, this sort of young, sort of bright officer. And at some point, and I don't know if we know exactly all the details about it, but at some point he catches the eye of General Washington. Now, General Washington and the Continental Army wasn't a massive, brilliant, you know, you know like the US Army today is a gigantic organization. <laughs> It's absolutely a, a beer moth of a thing. Yeah. And, uh, and there's, there's many, many, many extremely bright people. Well, back then, it was quite sort of struggling, really. Congress had not really given it enough money and resources yeah. to, to actually operate properly. You, you brought this um, up earlier in, in one of our episodes um, about this period of history. Uh, and uh, you're just making me think. So, so they kind of, they're scrounging for goods. They're scrounging for, like, there's letters about them not having boots, them not having resources. And because of the make of America right now, they're not allowed to go around and just pillage the, from their own countrymen their supplies. They're really dependent on an independent purse to supply them. And, and they're not really well supplied. Yeah. No, that's and there's no really taxation for this yet. There's no infrastructure hmm. to support the army yet. It's kind of just the largesse of a few people who are interested in it. And they're looking for donations. Is there a donation arm of this, like fundraising <laughs> for this? Well, it comes out of a lot of private wealth, to be quite honest. Yeah. So the Congress, the continental Congress, uh, I've got the Articles of Federation, which is a fairly loose, we'll come back to that later, oh. but a, a loose sort of legal framework, sort of base everything on. It's like sort of a, a proto-constitution. It's not even really that, but <clears throat> Congress have got, um, as they have today, at least in theory, uh, they hold all the purse strings and they say, oh, yeah, we'll vote you a certain amount of money. Whether that money ever ends up in the hands of quartermasters to buy boots and rifles and uniforms and things is another question. Mm -hmm. So what actually happens is quite often, a lot, um, it's sort of private donations, philanthropy, private, rich private people g just give money. Or even there is sort of going around and getting donations from individual little old ladies and things, mm -hmm. if they can. Mm -hmm. And they're given, they're usually given promissory notes. This will come back actually later when Hamilton's in government. Um, lots of individual people are given promissory notes. The Congress promises to give you your few dollars back when, when we win which didn't look likely in the first to begin with anyway didn't look mm. likely at all um so yeah the the money issue is a real a real issue and they haven't got enough of it at all <laughs> okay and so with um, that with that just understood and then we can go back to how does hamilton prove his use to washington right yeah so what washington needed is a, a first class staff now any general or commander in the field has a staff around him. You'll have staff officers. The staff officers are sort of not in the front line. You're not sort of usually, we're not really uh, expected to get involved in combat. You're supposed to have other abilities, uh, or organizational abilities, leadership abilities. If you're on the staff of a very senior general, um, you're, you're sort of right next to him. You're sort of quite often given, if you're a senior member of, of a staff officer, you're given uh, lots of powers. You can go around and order colonels around and other generals perhaps even. Mm -hmm. And and um, depending on how loose your commander is, he will give you sort of very general orders, very general uh, tasks to do. And you're given carte blanche to just go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. Now, where Hamilton is brilliant with words a great writer basically 
a first class mind and a great writer. On Washington's staff, apparently he had hardly anyone that was capable with that sort of stuff. Okay. He had some excellent uh, first class staff officers and uh, aides de camps. Well, well, Hamilton's made an aide de camp because he could write. So there's lots and lots of correspondences and letters from Washington through the war years. And we know, we think in some cases, and we know in many other cases, that it's just Hamilton writing and Washington will just sign the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. All the words are Hamilton. Hmm. So he sees this, this bright kid, this bright artilleryman who's brilliant with words and, and is highly capable. And so he accepts him into his family. And now I've, I haven't chosen that word. That's a word that has been used at the time and historians love it ever since. That Washington had um, a, a family, obviously not his actual real family, but he had a, a tight clique of people around him that he called his family. And if you were in that clique, he was sort of loyal to you till the day he died. And not many people were in it. You know, he only picked the best and the brightest. And for whatever reason, you know, we don't have it in fantastic detail. He picked Alexander Hamilton to be mm. in his family. He was, became an aide de camp. Okay. He wrote Washington's letters. So now right there, that's sort of a key, key, key turning point in Alexander Hamilton's life. He goes from being this, this, this immigrant bastard <laughs> with nothing going for him apart from his, his intellect, his gift of the gab, his yeah. ability with words. And now... He's in the family of George Washington, who, you know, no one, nobody would have known Washington would become the first president and become this sort of this towering statesman. Mm -hmm. No one would have known that at this point. In fact, most people, if you were going to put money on it in 1776, you would have put money on that. They wouldn't even win the war. The British army was probably more, most more likely to win this war. Mm -hmm. And all these guys, all these founding fathers would probably be be hung as traitors or at yeah. least put in prison for a long time yeah. so but nevertheless we know how it all plays out and so that is a key turning point when he when he catches the eye of washington that was the moment when you know the trajectory if he plays his cards right his trajectory to the upper echelons of the american establishment are sort of it's it's there open yeah. for him that path is now open to him do we know uh, his feelings for Washington? I mean, this is a pre-psychological era, but if you if you have a bastard and then he's taken in by a, a patriarch, I wonder to what degree that relationship um, becomes kind of a shadow of father-son or if uh, Washington gives legitimacy to the otherwise illegitimate Hamilton on a familial level, on a, on a even kind of a semi-estate level. Um, yeah, so he doesn't become a surrogate father in any legal way, nothing about a state or anything like that. Yeah. But everything short of that, yes, yeah. Hamilton absolutely looked up to him as some sort of father figure, absolutely adored him. Uh, when at a later point in his career, Hamilton is a disgraced, semi-disgraced, Washington stands by him in okay. his lowest moments, years and years and years after this. Washington stands by him like 100%. Um, and Hamilton obviously looks up to Washington as his as well. He's the commander of the of the army for a start. So just it, that in and of itself yeah. is quite incredible. And that he's given him this chance. Um, yeah, he absolutely looks up to him and reveres him hugely. When Washington dies, uh, just of old age, Hamilton's extremely upset, a little bit broken by it. Hmm. Um, he says he can't really express how how distraught he is at Washington's death. Okay. So yeah, their relationship was extremely close, but there okay. were hiccups. So one thing to say is I mentioned a few times that Hamilton wants to be a, an actual war hero. He wants to fight in combat. He wants to bloody his sword, so to speak, or literally. Um, and he wants to win glory on the battlefield. That's what he wants. Now, so this position has been given, albeit extremely privileged and really quite senior for his years, is actually really frustrating to him. Because as an aide de camp for General Washington, you're not going to see any combat. And he keeps saying to Washington, you know, let me at him. Give me a, a command in the field, please. That's all I want. And Washington keeps saying to him, no, you're too valuable to me. I can't. You're too valuable. I need you. 
And so eventually, because the war goes on for a few years, a uh, good sort of f- f- four or five years, eventually Hamilton says, look, I, 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 uh, I resign as aide-de-camp for you, for, for you, and I'm thinking about leaving the army entirely because they used to have one-year contracts. He was saying to Washington, he was making noises, like, when my contract's up, I'm, I'm, I'm out. Um, if you don't give me a battlefield command. And so right at the end of the war, 1781, Washington relents. There's sort of a bit, a bit, little bit of a battle of wills, even. It's the only time they really had a hiccup in their relationship, hmm. but it was that. Hmm. And Hamilton says, you know, I want, I, I want to see some action. And so, yeah, in the end, Washington does relent. And, There's like um, just a hint, just a hint of like Abraham giving up Isaac, you know, allowing, mm, the, mm. allowing that son, sacrificing of the son kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There is, yeah there's an element of that to it for sure. Um, so he does give him a command in the first battalion, fifth field artillery, which incidentally still exists today. I believe someone out there might correct me if I'm wrong on that. I How does one the bloody oldest... their sword as an artilleryman? Do you just well, ride the ride the bomb into camp combat like uh, Doctor Str- <laughs> Strangelove or something? <laughs> Well, he does, yeah. Quite often, uh, artillery is used in a battle, in an 18th century battle, up until a point, and then you need to go forward with everyone else. Or if your battery is overrun by the enemy, well, you're in hand-to-hand combat then, aren't you? Okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not ideal. Hopefully, you wouldn't want your gunners to uh, get into close combat, but quite often, for all sorts of reasons, they would still. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I believe uh, the 1st Battalion, 5th Field Artillery still exists, which is one of the only units from the Revolutionary War which still exists. Hmm. I've, uh, I heard somebody say that. I don't know if that's actually true, uh, but it sounds great. It's very romantic. <laughs> um, and so in 1781, he's at the Battle of Yorktown, which is really the culminating battle of the Revolutionary War. It's where a lot of English troops are sort of bottled up in Yorktown. And um, where is this? Do and, you know where this is? Um, Yorktown. Geo- where is Yorktown? Um, uh, it's on the James Peninsula, which is, um, gosh, where is it? I can't remember exactly. I'd have to look it up. Um, it's in the south, isn't it? It's south of New York somewhere. I can't remember. Hmm. Gosh, I should really know that. New York. Sorry, Benjamin. That's it is just outside New York, is it? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, on, it's on the James Peninsula. Yeah, so it'll be... Yeah, it's there. Um, he was a bit frustrated, though, still. Um, one of the things he did, one anecdote he did, was to drill his men in sight of the British Army. You know, sort of line them up and start doing... Start, start drilling them. And, um, every, like, within range of their guns... Uh, which is sort of crazy, a bit suicidal. Um, <laughs> some of his men, there's like letters from his men saying, "I don't know, I don't know what he thought he was doing." And the <laughs> and the British didn't fire back. Uh, they think that probably the British were sort of thought it was a a trick or a gambit or something, huh. so they didn't actually fire on them, although they could have done. But what that tells you, you know, that's just, that's just an indication of um, that he's not just sort of really chomping at the bit, but he's sort of desperate. Yes. So. Uh, action sort of desperate to see some gun play some sword play um, just for for context or just for the broader con- uh, understanding of what's going on did washington engage in any diplomacy himself with the british and the meaning had hamilton any uh you know involvement in the diplomacy or was that all other people uh not the not washington the general but the congress or whatever they're called the people who are ordering or telling washington to win this war what what was the relationship between washington and hamilton and the british at this point or throughout yeah, so this for period hamilton, none for oh. none he's still uh, a junior officer yeah. he's still in his early 20s so he'd have no diplomatic but if but if he's writing the letters he might be Engaged. Oh, right. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I, I suppose I do see what you mean. Uh, but no, no, no. Okay. He was. He had no control over any policy. Washington was obviously sending lots and lots of correspondence to Congress. But it'd be Congress that does all the diplomacy. Okay. Um, and in fact, right up until well, after Yorktown, really, um, the British uh, Parliament 
and army aren't really interested in finding peace particularly. So what happens is uh, Yorktown is in uh, 1781 and then the actual peace isn't signed for another two, which is the last big battle, the last engagement really. But but the, the war isn't formally brought to a close for like another two years. And British troops are stationed in New York on Manhattan for like another two years while they wrangle over the peace. Um, so we're quite often used to the end of hostilities and then peace is signed more or less straight away, you know, like in World War Two or World War One. Yeah. Right. Sort of straight after or, or the Gulf War or something. Yeah. But no, that's not often how it was in the 18th century. Well, Both especially if, the, still... if you're talking across the entire Atlantic Ocean, if that's the length of diplomacy yeah. without wireless going on. No Elon Musk to Starlink your, uh, your representatives together. That's another thing. Yeah, it could often take months for correspondence to get back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, the peace took a couple of years but nonetheless, after Yorktown, it, both sides appreciated that sort of the hot war was over. Oh, okay. And um, uh, but so at at Yorktown, um, <laughs> despite being an artilleryman, he storms redoubts. Redoubts are like a um, a, a, a defended position. Um, there's like redoubts nine and ten, I believe Hamilton was involved in. What do you mean? And he storms, storms them. He just jumps on a cannon and rolls it down a hill and busts through their line. <laughs> no, not on a cannon, on foot. He is literally on foot, <laughs> the first over a breach, and okay. uh, engaging in sword play. Okay. And even for the 18th century, sword play wouldn't necessarily be all that common, although there was still a fair amount of it. But yeah, he was like the first over the breach, uh, like redoubt nine, I think, hmm. having hand to hand combat with with British soldiers. And is this from his words or Remarkable. is this like, this is, this is uh, witnessed by other people. Like this isn't oh, no, him definitely just wit- telling a story. Like he actually No, no, witnessed glory. by other people. Okay. No, he's a genuine war hero. Okay. Um, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. It wasn't just him talking big. And one of the things, although there were lots of elements to Hamilton's character, which weren't really um, particularly endearing, he wasn't a liar or very rarely anyway. Um, huh. he wouldn't just make something up like that because if he got found out to be lying, he would lose all his honor yes. and he couldn't have that. He was all about honor. Like, like fact, he says, that's he, one of the big he'll, things. He'll, he'll sacrifice his life, but not his character. That's right. That's right. So one of the big things, one of the big themes that will come up again and again and again, perhaps one of the main themes of his life really is about honor is that whatever it takes, he, he, he won't give up his honor and he wanted battlefield honor. And so he was in the in the van in the vanguard right up the front at Yorktown, and um, and didn't even get wounded, and he took those redoubts, um, and in fact he sent a letter back to his wife Elizabeth, who he sometimes called Eliza and sometimes called Betsy, um, uh, uh, an heiress to a, a very rich New York family. Um, he wrote this. He wrote, quote. Beloved Betsy, my duty and my honour obliged me to take a step in which I put your happiness in peril. I commanded an attack on one of the enemy redoubts. You'll read all about it in the newspapers. I carried it off in an instant. There will be, I assure you, nothing more of this kind. And in two days, I will set off for Albany, where they lived. Uh, uh, May heaven bring us speedily together and let us be never more separated. Does that come true? Yeah, 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 yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't even wounded, I don't believe, and uh, and the war, I mean, the war, the hot war, anyway, was over. And the romantic over. bit of never leaving her side. Yeah, they stayed married. Uh, they were still married upon his death. She outlived him for decades. She lived to be a very old lady. She lived into like the eighteen fifties, and uh, never mm-hmm. gave up her love. Him was like his staunch defender to her last breath. Um, although they did have a bit of a rocky road a bit of a rocky go of it um as i mentioned earlier old alex hamilton did like the ladies mm. so he got himself in a bit of deep water but we'll get into that where he, where he wasn't entirely faithful um uh, but we'll get into that when it comes up but she yeah. stood by him through it through sort of a, a bit of a public humiliation yeah. she stood by him and like i say after his death became his sort of staunchest uh, defender mm. um mm. yeah 
So yeah. okay. So did, does he get in, get in trouble for this action that he takes uh, uh, as an artilleryman uh, taking that redoubt? Does Washington scold him or anything like that, or is he celebrated and no? things go? Forward? Yeah, no, 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 absolutely not. No, in the heat of the action, that was what he was required to do. So he did. Like I say, there's no more need to bombard a position. We're all storming it now. Sort of yeah. the cannon play is over with. We're all pushing forward now. <laughs> and um, so, no, 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 he was far from in trouble. It was what was, it was more than what was required of him. So, again, it, it was uh, hmm. uh, something like a hero. Um, you can't question his, his bravery on the field. And that's what he wanted. That's what he wanted. He wanted to be able to say and mean it that, um, that I did uh, gallant things <laughs> in the face of the enemy. And mm -hmm. he did. I mean, um, so, yeah. So how does, how does winning this war um, cement in his idea what he's looking for with regard to independence, with regards to, to what they're going to build? Now that they won... And and do have you seen that like the, his change of of attitude and and ambition for the state of America or for these colonies like what he's fighting for and then what the next step is and how this coalesces in his mind or in relation with all these other founding fathers? Yes, yes, absolutely. So straight after the war or before the war, uh, so the, there's there's Yorktown, but then let's say another couple of years before it's sort of formally a peace treaty and anything. But so straight away he goes back to New York and starts up as a lawyer. He doesn't pass the bar for another few years, but he starts up as a lawyer, hmm. um, Alexander Hamilton, attorney at law. Um, he, he tries to become a lawyer in New York, or does. Um, and he's what is he well. because, prosecuting? Because he what can he... write. He can read and write very well. Okay. Sorry. So like, what, what kind of law is he practicing? What, what, who's he an attorney for? Like, estates? Well, actually, that's, and, yeah, that, um, that's interesting. Quite often, well, he got a reputation throughout all of his adult life, really, as being sort of suspicious despite everything he just did on the battlefield of being suspiciously pro-english quite a lot of the people uh, around that time you'd be an american you'd be a, a patriot but you'd also have probably um a leaning one way or the other towards france or england they're oh. sort of the two main powers in europe are france and england okay. and they're obviously at each other's throats and have been since time immemorial <laughs> yeah and um and, and so you would probably have an inclination politically in your worldview one way or another between France and England. And he was always in the, the English camp. Um, and so one of the things he did as a lawyer was to defend old loyalists. So one example, just oh. to give you an example, <laughs> this one lady had owned uh, an establishment, whether it was a, a bar or a boarding house or something, and she was a loyalist. And when the war kicked off, it was just taken off of her. It was just, you know, you're a, you're a dirty loyalist. Be thankful you're not raped and tar and feathered, but mm. whatever, we're taking your property. That's okay. definitely happening. Um, and after the war, she said, look, I should be reimbursed for that. Come on, you just stole that. And so it goes <laughs> to, uh, goes to, um, it goes to, to, to court. And uh, Hamilton defends her and other people like her. In that case, for instance, they said that she should get some rent until the money's repaid. Okay. So he won that case, so, essentially. So, so that's, that's this, sort is a, of thing. this is a good detail. So basically the, um, the Patriots win uh, this war, but they still have to make peace with, because they're all Anglophile, they're all cousins, they're all deeply interwoven, these loyalists and Patriots, and they have to make peace. So, so one side wins, and to what degree are they going to punish the other side? So we can, you, you, you surmise that if the Founding Fathers lost their gambit, they would be, they would be hung or put in prison. They didn't necessarily do that to the loyalists. No. And so there's adjudication, no, no. And, and Hamilton is involved in kind of mapping out how we live together through through the auspices of the law and this law is based on common law i guess which is a whole other conversation i just want to mention <laughs> yeah. yeah well the law what the law is going to be in this land yeah of the, the 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 newly born united states of america what the law is going to be is still up for debate yes a bit there's the English common law, of course, which can be the foundation of everything. But, um, yeah, what the judiciary is going to be is still up for debate. And that's sort of the next chapter in his life where you say, um, you know, how, do, how does he now get involved in um, sort of statesmanship? Uh, 
mm-hmm. if you like. So, so before the war and also during it, as I say, he was a great writer and he was uh, a, a, a polemicist. He would write pamphlets and things. And he was on the periphery of the legal profession or straight after the war gets sort of deeply into it. Now, that is exactly the sort of person that could get elected to something like a con- continental congress or something like that. That's exactly the sort of person that your community, because even New York City is still tiny, or relatively tiny, still roughly. I mean, compared to today's standards, tiny. And so uh, there's not an endless amount of people that are sort of of that level, if you like. And if you're sort of you've got a bit of name recognition, if you're something of a war hero, mm-hmm. you're connected to the great George Washington, mm-hmm. and um, and you're, you're a lawyer, and and you're just one of the leading lights. But he's still very young. Like I say, he's the youngest of the, the founding fathers. It's sort of easily. He's like 26 or um, so at this point. Yeah, in, in exactly. 18, yeah. When, when, at that battle. Um, yeah, 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 it would have been. Yeah, 26, 27, yeah, 28. Yeah, yeah. So he's it, towards yeah. his 30s. He's approaching his 30s. He's doing lawyer work, mm. kind of sorting mm. out these estate cases and stuff like that. And is there yeah. start to be an election? Is that what you're, you're building up to? Like, yeah, no, not yet. Not yet. No. Okay. So, I mean, his position, I've got a quote here from him and this sort of sums up his, his sort of thinking or his position, his position straight away is that we need order. We need a strong government. The, we've just won a war. But it, everything we've just won, oh yeah, our independence, could all count for nothing, could all fall apart very, very quickly mm. if we don't have a strong government. Yeah. Because if we don't get our if we don't get our act together, what's to stop Britain from just send like five years from now, ten years from now, sending another massive army and just defeating okay. us again somewhere down the line if we don't get it together? So his position, political position, had always been: we need to get organised here. We need to be serious. We need yes. to have a, a, a centralised strong government. Anyway, here's a quote from him. And he said, um, quote, I'm a stranger to this country. My talent and integrity are unrewarded. Oh, sorry. Actually, that's a slightly wrong quote. <laughs> that's one a bit later I was going to read. He said, sorry, he said this quote, uh, our job is to make independence work. But what a terrible situa- situation we're in. The country has galloping consumption like TB, it's coughing itself to death. Hmm. The country has galloping consumption. The case is getting desperate. Uh, I I have a powerful remedy for this problem, strong Hmm. government. And if not taken quickly, the patient will die. Hmm. Um, Let me just... So he goes from uh, standing next to Liberty Pole saying we need to free ourselves, free ourselves, free ourselves. Now that they're free, we need to control ourselves. Yes, all right. Yeah. Like that anecdote on the steps of King's College, he's all for a revolution, he's all for radical political change, but it can, it should not be a mob, it should not be anarchy. Okay. But there's the rule of law. Yeah. Is more important than almost anything else. This is this I is the heart of that. this is the heart of the American uh, Revolution and why it works out because they oh, right. wrestle with this deep contradiction between slavery and freedom, between independence and control, between order and, and anarchy. And, and somewhere in between order and anarchy is that, is that balance of independence, of freedom, of personal choice, of agency. Yeah, that's yeah. a sweet spot. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Uh, one quote there I, 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 I started to read out, it was, uh, it was where <laughs> he was uh, very um, uh, frustrated with both his time as an aide de camp in Washington's army and afterwards when he's trying to make everything, by the force of will, he's trying to make everything work and sort of the whole world isn't just doing what he wants. (laughs) The frustration (laughs) of that, (laughs) you know, um, especially as a a younger man, we've probably all experienced that, you know, why isn't it, why doesn't everyone listen to everything I say? And, And, you know, I know what's correct and right, why, why isn't everyone doing it? <laughs> anyway, he wrote this. I'm a stranger to this country. My talent and integrity are unrewarded. Uh, our countrymen have all the folly of an ass and all the passiveness of sheep. They're determined not to be free. <laughs> I hate Congress. I hate the army. I hate the world. I hate myself. End quote. <laughs> now, that's quite a revealing 
you know, on a psychological level, it's quite a revealing yeah. thing to say something like that. Yeah. Um, well, do we know much about his religious life? If he was sincere about that, or if he just went through the paces of that, to what degree, uh, you know, Christianity, um, because we know that Jefferson wasn't Jefferson. who rewrote the Bible, uh, and kind of like he was deeply more religious, deeply religious. Um, or at least that was a big part of his intellectual life was what about Hamilton? Well, all these men are Christians. Yeah. And to us, well, I don't know how religious you are, but to most people in the West, most people I grew up with, um, we're not particularly pious, you know, to us, they would seem quite pious, Mm -hmm. you know, praying, praying all the time, um, Mm -hmm. exalting to God quite regularly. Does that happen um, occur in, uh, in Hamilton's literature, like the the? Yeah, no, the, not so much. So he does, so he does say it and things that like talk about God and heaven and all that sort of thing. Yeah. They're, they're all absolutely Christians, um, but not sort of not to the point of being a zealot. Nowhere near. So Jefferson is an interesting one because Jefferson, by the end of his life, people are accusing him of being accusing him of being an atheist. Okay. Okay. By the end of his life. So I misspelled Jefferson. Okay. People were saying that you're sort of so politically pragmatic. You sort of abandoned hmm. Christ oh, in a wow. way. They, it and sounds like they accused said, him of being a centrist <laughs> fence sitter. Whereas others have said about Jefferson, no, 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 that's completely unfair. He was, he was never anything like that. I mean, look at this quote here and that, that quote yes. there right at the end of his life. He's still, he still absolutely a, sort of a, a pious Christian, no doubt about that. Hamilton, sort of in the same boat. Um, uh, yeah, I'd say you know, absolutely a Christian, no doubt about that. But um, it would be impossible to accuse him of being an atheist or even a crypto atheist. But it wasn't a massive part of his life. Okay, he had no pretensions to ever join um, the clergy or anything like that. Okay, um, he doesn't go on and on and on and on about religion. Um, <clears throat> for example, one thing that sprung to mind. <clears throat> pardon me. One thing that just sprung to mind is there's some letters of Sir Francis Drake, which is obviously a lot earlier, sort of the 16th century. So Francis Drake would write letters home and they read almost like a prayer. They're extremely religious. Everything he says is couched Mm -hmm. in biblical terms um, referencing the scriptures sort of endlessly and like a very, very long exaltation to Christ at the beginning and the end of his letter. So these guys are not really like, well, Hamilton isn't like that. Yeah. He's not like that. Well, it's a different period, but, it, but also they're kind of uh, separated from the control of the Catholic Church. Like, the, and all the iconography and like the grand tradition of, of Western religion is kind of, they're removed from it. They're, they're in the new world. So it's not mm-hmm. as prominent just in their day to day life and their architecture and, and the way that life unfolds there because they're just, they're kind of in a different world. Yeah, depending on whether you're talking about the southern colonies or the New England colonies, much more north, and then the sort of the central ones like New York, um, they have different traditions of how religious they are. So like the yeah. more northern ones, the New England states, uh, were sort of uh, more Puritan. Yes. They were originally founded by Puritans, who were, some of them, uh, extremely, extremely uh, religious. Nice. Yes. Very, yeah, very much so. It's sort of the absolute cornerstone of all their thinking. Um, some of the more southerly ones, the first sort of pl- uh, first sort of Virginian settlements, some of them were fleeing England because of religious persecution and were fairly adamant that they were going to keep religion out of the 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 state, their state, as much as possible. So depend because the East Coast of America is massive, you know, it's, it's yes. a huge stretch of land, and depending where you were, was it was a very different story. Okay. But Hamilton, coming from Nevis or Saint Croix, uh, um, it played a part in his life, of course, um, but it wasn't sort of, you know, it didn't inform all of his thinking remotely. Okay. Um, so so, yeah. so but, he's he's being a lawyer in New York. Things start happening. Yeah. Like, what what is America going to be? What are we going to be? Yeah. And he's like, we have to be something. We have yeah. we have to organize ourselves. You're a bunch of sheep and asses, and we need leadership. <laughs> we need we need uh, organization. We need to be something. So he's starting mm-hmm. to get this itch for identity, for the American identity or the American power structure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So he moves to Fifty Seven Wall Street. And, uh, you know, Wall Street then isn't as it is now, you know, a massive built up um, sort of uh, commercial area. Uh, there, was, there would be commercial uh, uh, residential homes there. He moves to Wall Street 
um, and he's got this burning fire in his in his belly to be more than just a lawyer. Yeah. Um, and uh, he has this idea. He's not the only one, but he has this idea that we need to get all the thirteen colonies together and um, have a convention about what is to be done. That's a, that's a Lenin line. It couldn't be more inappropriate. But what is to be done? Um, mm. <laughs> um, because he sees, and again, he's not the only one, but he sees that we really need a single country, a single state. Now, if you look at the chronology of these things, um, the uh, the Constitution isn't until, what is it, 87, 1787? Mm. And Washington doesn't become the first president until 89? Yeah, 89. And so, but like, the war's over, Yorktown's in 81, the, the peace is in 83, so wait, there's a few years, there's like six years or whatever. Yeah. Uh, where you, you, so some people think, ah, oh, you know, Washington and Lafayette win at Yorktown, and then, and then there's the United States, and then there's the, Consti the, the Constitution is just there, George Washington becomes president yeah. straight away. No, 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 no. There's years uh, uh, pass by. So this is so it's a long process. That's, that's a long process then, and mm -hmm. there's a limbo going on. And some of the, especially in the South, some of the Virginia men are sort of quite happy the way it is. They don't necessarily want uh, or feel they need one sort of centralized. Well, I mean, yeah, they're just and, they just want to trade. They want to be left alone. You know, they got the British off their backs, but they're still trading with the British. They have this huge trade going on. Yeah. Yeah, and just let they, me grill, bro. Just let me farm, bro. That, yeah, they're happy. Yeah. They're being just allowed to do that. Let me slave, bro. Why do they want? To, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah the, why the, do I need a new a new tyrannical government? Yes. Why do yeah. I want that? And what about the northern states? What are they aching for? And what, what's their relationship post-war, pre-constitution with Britain, with the UK? Oh, with Britain. Oh, yeah, well, are they um, like the, 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 oh, oh. they lacking connection? Do they do they like how how do they proceed to like their destiny? Like what they want up north? What they want down south? You're saying they just kind of want to do their thing and make bank. Uh, the north is uh, in what relationship to the south and and to Britain? Uh, well, so they're still trading because trade is a two way thing, isn't it? Of course, um, if you refuse to trade with someone. Both sides are losing money then. Yeah. So anyway, the, the Atlantic trade uh, between Britain or just Europe and uh, uh, the, the East Coast of America just still continues. Okay. But the northern states are smaller, aren't they? And um, they're, they're sort of more vulnerable in a strategic sense. It does make sense to be a federation. You're just stronger, strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. Um now, you've got people in – when you've got a population of millions, you've got people everywhere of all different mind. So there's some people in the north that don't necessarily want a, a federal government, a centralised federal government. Um, uh, so, yeah, there certainly are. So, well, it's an argument that has to be made. Hamilton and like-minded people have to argue, make the argument. They become known as federalists. I'm getting a little ahead of, my, ahead okay. of myself. Um, but so – they, uh, yeah, not everyone wants it. So the middle states, the middle colonies, um, places like New York. Well, it's a great example, actually, New York. Okay, so New York State um, isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily very much want a, fe a central, strong, federalised government. New York City does. Hmm. Again, by and large, not entirely, not every single person, of course. Yeah. That's not yeah. how reality is. But, you know, so the state doesn't, but the city does. But then the governor doesn't. The governor of the state, uh, a bit later anyway, Governor Morris. Um, so yeah, it's it's a complicated, it's yeah. a complicated yeah. uh, situation. Well, I mean, that that kind of echoes what we're dealing with now with the blue c cities, the red states. The you know the, that kind of the the distinction between the cities kind of want centralized control, this blue blue state kind of thing, and then the rural. Uh, states or areas largely want kind of more freedom want to be less controlled so that that kind of tension has been existing for a really long time yeah but i think what most people realize 
apart from a few sort of diehards in the South, what they realize is that the whole thing, this whole project of the United States is sort of held together by scotch tape and bailing wire. It's held together by um, the Articles of Federation, which were put together, you know, um, sort of in the heat of the moment a bit. That's an exaggeration, but still. And these Articles of Federation aren't really good enough. They don't really cover all the contingencies they need it to cover. It isn't really a strong framework for going forward. Okay. It just isn't. And everyone sort of seems to realise that. And people like Hamilton sort of not only realise that, but sort of push hard to get something new put in place. Okay. Um, well, so, so just in general terms, what do the Articles of Confederation establish? Just that we're going to work together for the, this basic yeah. common cause? That's basically it. And then we'll make decisions by like this process of like people will vote there. There'll be representatives from the different states and we'll hash out That's it. what we're going to do. Okay. Exactly all that sort of thing. So where they had a Continental Congress and then subsequent Congresses and that we'll, we'll pull um, money in certain ways. We'll have, we'll respect your laws. You know, this state will respect this other state's laws about this type of commerce and on and on and on, okay. all that sort of thing. But it is sort of a, a stopgap. Like I say, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's not comprehensive, let's say that. Um, and so many people just realise that you're going to need something better. But, I mean, all this takes place over a few years. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's not suddenly someone says it or Alexander Hamilton says that and everyone's like, OK. No, it takes years for it to sort of come to a head yeah. in all sorts of different ways. Yeah. Um, well, in the end... We have to get through it a bit. In the end, uh, there is a, a, a another congress. Is called this one's called the Confederation Congress, where they sort of do start to decide. They do they do come to an agreement that the Articles of Federation aren't doing the job. Okay. And we need what, to. What year is we need this? to. Uh, so this would be well, I, I can't remember exactly, but it would be like eighty five. Yeah. Okay. Eighteen eighty four, eighty five, eighty six, somewhere in there. It must be. Yeah. It would be. Yeah. Um, and so um, another quick quote, um, Hamilton says, and this gives you a measure of the man, I think, a measure of his thinking. He says, quote, as a general marches at the head of his troops, so why as political leaders march at the head of affairs? They don't wait for events, but know what actions to take. The actions they will take produce the events, end quote. So he's selected, he's selected to be one of the New York delegates. There'll be three delegates sent. And um, he's the most hard line of them, uh, easily, pushing for some sort of new settlement. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, well, and so we get into the story of the Constitution itself. Uh, they go to Philadelphia for that. The, the 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 capital is actually the capital of the United States has changed a bit. It was sort of nominally to begin with in Philadelphia. At one point during the war, when the British Army take Philadelphia, they move it to Baltimore. At this stage, it's essentially in New York. The capital is basically in New York, but they go to Philadelphia to um, sort of sort out the Constitution. And there's a, a, another separate convention, the Constitutional Convention. And and you know. To begin with, they task themselves with amending the Articles of Federation. Let's just tweak it. Let's add more to it. Let's just let's just build on what we've done. They quite quickly decide, no, let's start from scratch. Um, hmm. And uh, well, it, just that is a bit of a groundbreaking thing to decide. You know, no, we're, we're going to start from scratch. Yeah, um, a whole cloth country. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, well, so there's a long story all, all about that, all the various arguments. Hamilton argues very strongly. As I said earlier, he's a bit of a bull in a china shop. Um, um, he will just he will sort of browbeat people, just argue with them endlessly, never give anything up, tenacious. Um, and, uh, well, in the end, they come up with the Constitution, which is only really a four-page document. It's interesting to note, perhaps, that there's the, the sort of the three main founding documents of the United States, the, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, which is, you know, not long at all, 
um, the the constitutions only about four pages, and then later the Bill of Rights, which is the first ten amendments. Again, not that long. So the three founding documents are really very short, concise uh, documents, to be quite honest. Um, and mm -hmm. there needed to be a bit more meat on the bones to it to explain exactly what they meant. And I'll get to mm -hmm. that in a quick moment. Um, but what they did have um, is uh, they needed it to be ratified. So they come up with the constitution, but it doesn't mean that now suddenly that's the law of the land. All it means is they've written this document that they think is great. They think is a, a the basis for uh, a new republic. But each of the 13 states, let's stop calling them colonies now, each of the 13 states have to individually ratify it. And if nine of them don't ratify, you need nine. If any less than nine ratify, it doesn't become law. So they needed nine of the 13 to okay. Now, a lot of the states aren't happy with it. Lots of people, lots of the population aren't happy with the Constitution. It's funny, isn't it, how history goes? Now, you just thought, well, what? How could Americans not green light the Constitution? <laughs> that be? Well, lots of people, especially in the South, but not exclusively in the South, but lots of people in the South are like, well, this is not what we, we signed up for. This is not what we fought a war for, is it? In, the, in this Constitution thing you've just put in front of us, you're saying there's going to be an extremely strong executive branch with one man at the head of it. That sounds suspiciously like an elected king, a type of king. We, we just threw off a king. We don't want another one, even if you're going to call him president. You know, mm. we, we, you're, you're saying here in this, this constitution that you're going to tax us all over the place. We just had a war about taxation. We don't want to be taxed very much at all, if at all. And now you're saying you're definitely going to do it and you want us to, to sign off on it. Mm. Like, how about no, actually? Mm. You know, there's loads of things in it. Oh, you've talked about a judiciary wing of the government in here. And, uh, well, well, w sorry, what exactly do you mean? You haven't gone into very much detail in exactly what that means. And who's going to be a judge? And how are you going to pick them? And what sorts of courts are we going to have? Are they going to be based on English courts? Are you going to have, like, um, uh, what, what the, the, the questions are sort of endless. Because, as I say, the Constitution itself doesn't go into fantastic detail. Jefferson was in France, I believe, because he spent a lot of time in France as sort of a, a, a diplomat, senior diplomat extraordinaire and when he gets news of the constitution he's like he's he's sort of uh, famously not there he's sort of uh, conspicuous by his absence when he gets news of it he says oh my god like what are you doing you've got to write down exactly what your liberties are or aren't and that's what he, he that's why he says write down exactly like that he calls for a bill of rights the first 10 amendments you've got to say exactly what you are or aren't allowed exactly what your liberty is because mm -hmm. without that mm -hmm. it can be subverted mm -hmm. easily mm -hmm. um so and so what's hamilton's perspective on uh the constitution the bill of rights and his hand on that right yeah. well it's good you should ask because he went ahead and wrote lots and lots of articles and essays about that in fact well so he was so his position is he's absolutely for um a single republic you know made up of these 13 states um so he's for a republic he's for centralized federalized government and he's for the constitution he says he at one point anyway he sort of drops this eventually but to begin with he says you don't even need those bill of rights you don't even need those amendments necessarily it's that they're not really necessary anyway he drops that but but where people say over a few years a couple of years people are saying you know we're not sure about this constitution thing is this in our interest couldn't it quite easily be subverted into another tyranny here and there in all sorts of ways so james madison alexander hamilton and john jay write in the end 84 or 85 85 articles or, or essays opinion pieces in a way um arguing for the constitution sort of making the case yes the constitution like in minute detail yes the constitution is brilliant and here's why here's every single one of your fears mm. addressed mm -hmm. you don't need to worry about this or this or this because da, 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 da. 
Uh, John Jay only wrote, uh, I think, five of those of those articles of those um, papers. Well, that, well, collectively, they get called the Federalist Papers, and uh, they're they're mainly written by um, Madison and Hamilton. And uh, other than one or two, all the main ones are written by Hamilton, really. And it's actually they. Uh, it's, it's, it's important to bear in mind that they were written for an, specifically a New York audience. In hindsight, it looks like he's addressing all Americans. But in, in first and foremost, he's trying to win the argument in New York, New York State. He's trying to um, yeah, um, um, convince them that they need to ratify the Constitution because New York was really one of the more lukewarm states. Okay. Um, and so a couple of, couple of quick lines from them, for, just to give you a flavor of it, an example. Um, he, he wrote, he wrote, uh, laws are a dead letter without courts to expound and define their true meaning and operation. You know, so it's, it's questions as broad as that, you know, do we need courts? <laughs> you know, or another way, uh, why has government been instituted at all? Hamilton said, because the passions of men will not conform to the dictates of reason and justice without constraint. Okay, so some people were saying, oh, I don't think we necessarily need any sort of central government. We, we won the war with, without one, didn't we? We had Congress that sort of controls some purse strings and has very, very, very light touch control over things. But we don't need a centralised, strong federal government. We don't even need one. And Hamilton and Madison are saying in the Federalist Papers, no, we do. We do, though, because... because da, da, da. Well, that's a really quite a famous quote, that one I just read. Because there's a lot in there, isn't it? It's saying, men do not conform to the dictates of reason and justice without constraint. You, you sort of have to... He's saying, he's making the argument, you have to force men to abide by the law. Many of them will do it naturally, but many won't. Many won't. Hmm. And if they're allowed to just run amok and be, well, yeah, be anarchists, that, that, they will. That makes sense, generally speaking, but that doesn't answer the question of why all these different states need to have a central law. Are, are these different states not allowed to rule themselves and have the capacity to do as they will? So do they need one centralized? Like, how does that say that there needs to be one over 13. That's like if, if he was in, in, in Europe and saying, you know, trying to, trying to say, okay, we need Germany and France. We need to develop this European union. You guys can't control yourselves. You don't have like the agency to control yourselves. We need one reason overall. Right. It just seems like there's kind of a gap there. Yeah. No. So that's, that's the great, well, this is where Jefferson comes into it. Uh, is uh, we must have talked about it in the in the Jefferson conversation we had that there's the great Jeffersonian compromise, where he says uh, this is sort of one of the masterpieces of of the United States I think most people think um, why your republic has lasted to the present day, um, why nearly all republics end up falling apart but yours hasn't and in fact been in, in in all sorts of ways incredibly successful is the Jeffersonian compromise which is. We'll have, OK, we'll have a centralised federal government. OK, people like Hamilton can get their wish. And 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 we'll have a Congress, we'll have, uh, which is sort of, you know, you have many Congress people for the congressmen for the big states so that each each little pocket of land gets representation in Congress. But each state will only have two senators, regardless of how big or small they are which is a compromise. It means that the small states, at least in the Senate, will have an equal, some sort of equal say. Because lots of people who don't really know what they're talking about will often say, oh, it's not fair that Maryland and Rhode Island have got two senators and California and Texas also have only got two senators. That's not fair. That's stupid. It's not stupid. It's very deliberate. It's very deliberate and it's a stroke of genius. Hmm. Um, <laughs> That's the, that's the Jeffersonian as long as it works, yeah. compromise, along with, along with, that we'll have a centralised federal government that ultimately has jurisdiction, ultimate say over everything, and a uh, and a supreme court that has uh, ultimate say over everything. However, each state or each country, if you want to think of them as individual countries, will also have entirely their own legislature. You know, each state, isn't it? In America, has got its its own 
Congress and its own Senate and a governor who's like a president of the mm-hmm. state <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Um, uh, so each state will have really quite extensive say over its own laws and over how things are run in each mm-hmm. every state. So we're going to have both. We're going to have both. Okay. That's that's the stroke of genius that, that Jefferson and the Jeffersonian party um, came up with. Now, the question comes in, the exact balance. What's the exact balance that we're going to have between uh, states, states' laws and federal law? Mm-hmm. And, and, and so that's where the differences between people like Jefferson and Hamilton come into it. And one thing, just to sort of kind of state the obvious, but I think it does need to be stated because you can easily forget forget what I'm about to say in all of this, is that they're not following any roadmap. They're, they're doing all this for the first time. They, they can't look at some European country or some European federation and just say, oh, that worked. We're just going to do what – we're just going to steal that idea and do that. And there's no guarantee – that it's going to work. That's another thing. When you look back on history, it's one of the easiest things in the world, one of the easiest pitfalls for even good historians to fall into is to say, well, it was always going to be. The United States of America was always going to be this supreme success that was always going on to go on to be extremely powerful and rich. No, 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 no. In the, in the 1780s and 90s and 1800, the yeah, very, very early 19th century, there's no guarantee whatsoever the whole project wouldn't fall apart. It very nearly did a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's it's it all hangs in the balance. It very much is all hanging in the balance. It's very delicate gossamer of 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 of, of government. They're trying to build out of nothing, mm-hmm. out of thin air. I I I'm, I'm I've got nothing but admiration for these guys. I think yeah. the, the founding fathers are some of them um, incredible figures, very very intelligent, enlightened figures. It's pretty remarkable what they, what they were able to achieve. I think. So how how do the how does the get uh, ratified? What what and what is Hamilton's hand in getting it ratified? And then once it is, where does he land? Right. Yeah. So some of the states are sort of up. Some of the more northern ones are up for ratifying the Constitution straight away. Many aren't. New York um, ums and ahs for a long time. And well, like I say, for what is it? Uh, a year, about a year mainly Madison and Hamilton are penning these Federalist papers. And so it takes that long to sort of bring people round. Um, Because a lot of a lot of these, if you're sort of a successful, very rich landowner or trader, um, what you're probably thinking is, it's just simply this is, is it in my interest or not? Am I going to be making more money? Am I going to be more or less powerful? Yeah if we ratify the constitution um now no one can see into the future so lots of people don't know it's it's a a difficult hamilton having experience as a trader with commerce i wonder if that leaks into his um his arguments like about like the economic um possibility of this or or a benefit i guess yeah, and no, absolutely, that is part of his argument. He he's, he says, which is contrary to Jefferson, we need, the United States absolutely needs strong commerce. Without trade and commerce, okay. we're going to end up being weak or nothing. Jefferson thinks, you know, that's not as important. Um, sounds crazy to say, because a big part of the American story... United, the story of the United States is business. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember who it was now. Maybe it was somebody like Calvin Coolidge. I can't remember. Somebody said famous line saying, the business of America is business. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great commercial capitalist success. An incredible, mm-hmm. incredible one, really. And the standard of living uh, compared to other places in the world, just through through the roof. Um, and and but, during this period but, but, of time between between the Revolutionary War and the ratification of the um, of the Constitution, what about currencies? Does every state have its own currency? Mm. Like speaking of commerce, yeah, yeah. Well, again, that's another thing that Hamilton argues for. We need a centralized bank. We need one currency, the dollar, because before that, yeah, you had all sorts of different um, currencies floating around. 
And they're obviously, it's not uh, it's on sort of a gold standard, so you'd have actually precious metal coins, gold and silver and things. Uh, you know, he says we need one, we need one thing. So again, that's another that's another part of it, big part of it. Um, uh, just to, as you asked the question, how like what's what's Hamilton's role in it? Well, in New York at least, uh, the story of the New York ratification. Um, there's, he he was just I keep calling him sort of bullheaded, but that's one of the things. Like I say, he didn't have any political, not, not much political finesse. He was overbearing, um, condescending, really, an elitist. Um, here's one line he said of himself. He said, "Quote on this and every other occasion, I will counter directly without detour any obstacle that stands in my way." So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so there's sort of two camps here. Well, I talked about the Federalist Papers and people that want a, a strong central government, a, 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 a strong federal government. They, were, they called themselves the Federalists. And in fact, a little bit down the line here, there's basically a party, not a true political party as we have them today, but essentially a party, a faction that just called themselves the Federalists. Hamilton was sort of the de facto leader of it. We'll get into that a little bit later because um, maybe John Adams was their leader certainly once he became president himself but there's the federalists and the other party the other faction were anti-federalists yeah um and anti-federalists would say in fact there's a quote here from one of the leading anti-federalists who said uh you men of learning speaking to hamilton said you men of learning you lawyers will take control of this federal government Ordinary people with good sense will never be able to get elected. And after you grab all the power and the money, you'll swallow up all us little folk. It will be a government run by and for a tyrannical aristocracy. Oh, God, it sounds like the, the, the glimmer of QAnon is already alive and well. Well, Hamilton, uh, Hamilton um, uh, responded, quote, and whom would you have representing us in government? Not the rich, not the wise, not the learned. Would you go to some ditch by the highway and pick up the thieves, the poor and the lame to lead us? Yes, we need an aristocracy to be running our government, an aristocracy of intelligence, of integrity and experience. Mm -hmm. So that is sort of the debate in a nutshell, in a way. Yeah. That is exactly what the federalists and anti-federalists are discussing. Who are the um, elites? Who's this ar ar right. aristocracy now? And now you can Ooh. see how the, the 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 whiff of the accusation that Hamilton's a bit, bit too pro-English, you can see how that sticks, yeah. because people can then accuse him of, of uh, well Jefferson did, of saying well you want to be you want to make us another England then, mm -hmm. we might not have a king but in everything else you'll make us an England in all but name. Well yeah. that's not what we wanted. Jefferson thought that there should be small landholders and everyone will live in harmony that way. Mm, yeah. uh, and we don't need your banks and your bureaucracies. Um, <laughs> Libertarian, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, well, so well, yeah. So go ahead. So go ahead. Well, just to, just to move the story, kick the can down the road again. Uh, they get it ratified. Yeah, yeah. It starts to be established. Where does Hamilton go as it starts to coalesce into okay. a federal government? Yeah. So... Where he is General George Washington's boy, that hasn't changed. And George Washington, of course, is the first president. And there seems to have been very little doubt in anyone's mind that he would be the first president. He is the victor of Yorktown. He is the victor of the war. Um, Which was eight way, years often, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's often the way it, go, it went in the 18th century. Um, well, it's, it's often the way now. I mean, you've had many presidents in the 20th century who were great generals. Um, Eisenhower immediately springs to mind, not just the 20th century. I mean, uh, Ulysses S. Grant was a, a general of the armies. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt, um, Theodore, yeah. Yeah, Theodore Roosevelt was, was an army man, uh, on, at least to some degree. <laughs> and there were many other generals that came close. John J. Pershing came close. MacArthur had pretensions to be president one day. You know, um, some say Patton wanted to make a run at president. You know, it's, it's just not unheard of. Anyway, in the 18th century, it was much more the case, much, yeah. much more the case. Yeah. 
you know, someone like Napoleon, sort yeah. of a, a completely victorious general in the field, is the you know the crown is there to be taken out yeah. of the gutter, just picked Lions, up. Lions, not foxes. I'm just, gonna de- yeah. de- I'm just going to declare myself emperor now. You know, yeah. it's unfair to make any sort of comparisons between Napoleon and George Washington. That was a a, a bit of out of left field. There. I don't mean to do that, but the point remains <laughs> that you can go from being a general to being yeah. a shoe in for the top job, any sort of top job. And Hamilton's so, right there. Right, so he's his boy. He's sort of Hamilton. So. In uh, 89, when Washington becomes first president, briefly they did want to make him a king, um, like wanted to make Oliver Cromwell king. And they're just like, no, come on, no. That's the opposite of what we want here. Uh, so when he makes his first government, when Washington forms his first government, um, the two sort of main leading lights are Jefferson and Hamilton. Um, and he makes... Uh, Jefferson, Secretary of State, which is the equivalent of our Foreign Secretary, so in charge of all things foreign policy. Um, and Hamilton gets uh, the, the Treasury, Secretary to the Treasury. Well, well, okay, well, hold on just a second. Uh, yeah, what Treasury? Sure. So Congress has started yeah. to pool money already, so there is money that's coming in through taxation. Yeah. Yeah. But they have to yeah. institute this Treasury under the constitution right so what is this Mm -hmm. office of the treasury at that point when he inherits and then inherits it and then what does he do with that yeah okay right so um um sorry i'm just checking my notes here um there's one quote i'd like to read before i get into that if that's okay yeah um a quote from hamilton he said uh, after ratification, he said, quote, a new scene opens. The object now is to make our independence work. To do this, we must secure our, our union on solid foundations. It is a job for Hercules, for we must level mountains of prejudice. We fought side by side to make America free. Let us, hand in hand, struggle now to make her happy, end quote. Hmm. And so you ask a great question. What is the Treasury? Well, the Treasury Department then was the biggest Department of State easily. He's got more men working under him than anyone else. Well, like so, like the John IRS Adams is the Vice President. Sorry, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, just uh, if what is this Treasury doing? It's just counting money okay. and collecting money. Yeah, no, no, no. So it's in charge of lots of things. It's in charge of all customs, in and out. It's a custom service. Oh. Um, he's in charge of the Coast Guard. Um, that comes under the, the purview of the Pr- Treasury. Protecting commerce. Wow. Okay. Right, yeah. He's in charge of all import and export duties, all taxes, really. Yeah. Um, he's in charge of the entire economy. He's, he gets to be in charge of um, making policy about sort of how much industry the whole country is going to have. It's sort of massive. Um, well, uh, he's in charge of the currency. Are, are we going to have one single currency now? Um, are we going to have a national bank? Uh, he institutes the first mint, the national mint, for you know, you know, minting money. Um, he's in charge of all things to do with the stock market. There's a stock market in New York. He's in charge of regulating all of that, overseeing all of that. The SEC. All right. Um, okay. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> He's in charge of all the uh, the Treasury oversees all the spending of the state. So it's massive. It's much more than than the Treasury today. It's much, much more. Okay. Now, so he's that is, you could argue, the most powerful position in government that Washington gives him. You could argue sort of fairly easily that other than the president himself, he's the most powerful single minister secretary. Mm hmm. Um, and in a sense, some limited senses, he's more powerful than, than the president because the president legally is constrained in all sorts of ways. A president is is the head of the uh, um, executive branch of government and therefore is very, very explicitly not to, to get involved in the legislative branch of government or yes. the judiciary. Whereas... Uh, one of his ministers in cabinet is got a bit more, well, a lot more leeway to yeah. just get his hands involved in all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. And 
over over the uh, the eight years of George Washington's two administrations, he keeps giving Hamilton more and more responsibilities because he's capable, because he's able to do it. And so some people have said, and this isn't the correct word, and I know that, but lots of people have said that he becomes like a prime minister, a prime minister, in other words, the first minister, the okay. first among ministers. Yeah. Yeah. He has extraordinary power by the end of it. Extraordinary, really. <laughs> And what about the army that's not under... He has the Coast Guard, but the army at that point in time is uh, directly beholden to Washington. Uh, Hamilton doesn't have any... Uh, I, I know there's no, not exactly any wars or no use for an army. I, we, we don't even have a standing army. We, we went into that in an that's earlier right. episode. Um, that's right. So there's no standing got, army. Okay. So he's just got so much power. And there's no... It, 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 he's basically the first of the... Th Deep state. He's like the head of the deep state, uh, basically the right. the unelected yeah. <laughs> bureaucrats that can that yeah. actually control and run everything in the government. Yeah, yeah. And it begins that's with right. him. Yeah. Okay. Huh. <laughs> and so, what does so he what establish? The, okay. That how how does he like mold what that government or that aspect of the government does, okay. and how does he cement okay. that? So. So this is probably this is sort of when he's at the height of his powers. This period of his life, this eight years, is, and um, and he's got very very grandiose plans, great a, a great scheme for the whole republic, really. Hmm. And he's got his idea, he's got his own ideas, definitely. And when I say there's like the mint, the bank, the stock exchange, uh, lo lots and lots of institutions. He puts in place many 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 the framework for many many institutions. Hmm. The most fundamental ones, really, he puts in place or is, or is allowed to put in place. Wow. And um, one of the main things, though, the, 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 sort of the, the, the main political hot potato is debt. Now, I know your fair country is terribly in debt right now, as is mine. But yours even more so. I mean, to the tune of trillions, isn't it? It's absolutely absurd yeah. how much America is in debt right now. Um that might all end in a, some kind of disaster. Who knows? We shall see. Um, well, in the uh, 1790s, again, the brand new federal government found itself in some crazy kinds of debt, all kinds of debt. Okay. Uh, Hamilton decides that um, you have to honor it. So when countries are in stupid amounts of debt, there is one possibility you can default on your debts. You can declare like a, an individual can declare themselves bankrupt, can say, look, I've got no possible chance of ever paying a, a fraction of this back. And I want the state, I want law to uh, take that on board. I, can, I will not and cannot pay back my debts. I am bankrupt. And then there's things that can be done at that point. Like Alex Jones has to pay a trillion pounds. Or something. It's just, it's just not, never ever going to happen. Um, so... Countries can do that. You can default on your debts. Uh, Russia did it in the 90s, the early 90s. It defaulted on, it, on its international debts. Now, when you do that, it's very rare, very, very rare for countries to do that because it says you're clown shoes. It says you're a joke. It says you failed to be a proper country. It's what that says, right? It's remarkable, really, that Russia bounced back as quickly as it did um in 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 the case of russia but so hamilton hamilton's view is that we we really we, we need to pull out all the stops do whatever we can to not default because if we default we the, the rest of the world we've only just been born mm -hmm. the rest of the world will look upon us as complete jokers if we do that so whatever so then therefore whatever we need to do to prevent that from happening that's what we need to do and what we need to do is create a central bank, have a single currency, um, in, um, increase and encourage as much commerce and trading as we possibly can. All the things that the Jeffersonian party, soon to be calling themselves Republicans, nothing to do with the modern Republican party, um, all the things they're saying they don't want, all the things they're saying that we just fought a war to not have. Mm -hmm. Hamilton saying, no, 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 we're going to need that to survive. We need that to survive. So he's adamant that he's going to pay off the debts. Now, there's more to it. The individual states also have loads of debts. Well, I mentioned earlier that they would they would tell individual people, individual little old ladies that had given a few bucks here and there to help out the Continental Army during the war. They had given them promissory notes. 
that we will pay you back. So there's that on a grand scale. Individual people and the, the state itself, like Virginia or Massachusetts, have taken out massive international loans. They owed loads of money to France. France almost bankrupted itself, or did, in fact, completely bankrupt itself in order to pay for the American Revolutionary War. Anything to stick it in the eye of Great Britain. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, that both the states and the federal government owed loads of money. Now, what Hamilton wants to do, um, they called it assumption. He wanted to take all the debt of the individual states and have all that debt uh, that the federal government will take on all that debt and pay off all that debt. They would assume that debt. They called it assumption. Hamilton wants that. And he argues... This is the cornerstone of this is like one of the most important political hot, hot potatoes in this whole decade. He argues that in a way, national debt is good. Because it means that your creditors, the people you owe money to, have got a vested interest in you staying alive, in you continuing to be a country and a government because they want their money back. So that's a good thing. That's actually creates a, a power base for us. That gives us some sort of a foundation to build upon um if all the uh, the rich people from the various states if they're only going to get their money back if the federal government is a success well then they're going to be on board with the whole project it does make sense it does <laughs> make sense because on the face of it you think why would you just add more debt to loads of debt why do you want debt and that's what the Federalists, uh, sorry, the Republicans and Jeffersonians would argue. It's like, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. That's the opposite, surely. And he's saying, no, 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 no. I understand commerce. And he's actually not wrong, as long as it doesn't get out of control to the tune of trillions. As long as it's actually payoffable at some point, mm -hmm. it does make some sense. So anyway, in this whole period, the whole eight years of, 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 of Washington's uh, presidency, Jefferson and Hamilton are, are at each other's throats over exactly this sort of thing. Now, one of the things the, 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 the Virginians and the men of the South want is that they want the, the capital to be somewhere other than Philadelphia or New York. They would like it to be a bit more South. Yeah. Right. That's one of the main things they wanted. They thought that was really, really important. Um, for them, that was one of their biggest sort of political questions. And um, so <laughs> it's funny, really, they, they, may, they come to an agreement. At some point during that, that period, Hamilton and Jefferson are both living in New York and they literally bump into each other on the street. And Jefferson invites Hamilton to dinner. And uh, over dinner, they come to an agreement that, the the power brokers of the south will agree to assumption if hamilton and and the, and and the power brokers of of the north will accept that they'll move the the capital from new york to a more southerly location they end up picking washington dc on the potomac which isn't that far south but you know it's a much further south than new york mm. you know it's it's close to virginia isn't it um, closer to Virginia than New York is anyway. Um, so both are very, both men are very happy with that. Both think they've come away with a great win. And, uh, well, they have in a sense. Mm -hmm. It turns out Hamilton got the better of Jefferson in that one. His win was much more important, much bigger. It forwards his vision of government much more than moving the capital to Washington, D.C., which at the time was nothing. It was literally like a malaria-infested swamp. Okay. Okay. They built D.C. from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't actually move to D.C. until much later, way into the 19th century before the White House is built and and the, the seat of government is moved to Washington, D.C. That's not until like what the, the, the presidency of Monroe, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, many, many years later before that actually happened. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, at that, that dinner table agreement they so had. um yeah, sorry, go ahead. So it, it, just to be really fast and loose with history, if yeah. the United Kingdom became a kingdom through, let's just say King Arthur goes around, he does all these little wars with all the, and unites power through military might. How, how Hamilton consolidates power is through economic might. He consolidates everything through money, 
So America really is founded and bonded together through debt, through, through <laughs> commerce. Yeah. And that's how it started. Yeah. Those colonies started and, and grew powerful through that. And then that's what, that's how they're bound together. It wasn't like they, he didn't go through conquering all these states and making them all, all the governors bend the knee to him. He did it bending the knee through debt, through assumption. Yeah. Yeah. So he's like sort of, yeah, there's no, there's no, um, conquest right yeah so he makes the argument for ratification through the federalist papers he doesn't march on their state capitals with a body of men mm -hmm. and artillery yeah mm -hmm. and then binds it together with debt i suppose you could say <laughs> wow. that i mean just to say that um they do pay off a lot of it very quickly because his engine for commerce is successful very successful and so by just to give you an example of how much so by the time Jefferson himself is president um, in, uh, you know, like more than a decade after this, when Napoleon wants to sell Louisiana, which is a vast swathe of land, many, many times bigger than the modern state of Louisiana, almost a third of the continental United States, when they bought that Louisiana, so-called, off of Napoleon, they had, they had the credit to do so. They were able to... They had the liquid money and the ability to, to borrow yeah. the money to just pay for that incredibly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so here's a quick quote on that from Hamilton. He said, public credit is earned by good faith. States, like individuals who live up to their obligations, are respected and trusted. Those who don't are not trusted. So, you know, that's his view on how important it is to honour your debts. It means you can borrow more further down the line yeah well, and it's not it's not wrong is it i mean it's not wrong could you give a little bit of details debt, or no one trusts you with money does an it? overview of <laughs> like what what this economic engine like how he how he unifies the the economic power of the states at this point like like just through policy through i guess levies and duties and he just he has a bunch of middlemen going to the states and just like kind of urging everybody to just produce and trade yeah. And and I guess he yeah, protects so the waterways uh, with the Coast Guard, so it's pretty stable. He stabilizes trade, and then he just incentivizes the hell out of it. Yeah, well, very quick to say on the, the naval side, the British Army never stopped really taking the mickey a bit out of uh, American merchantmen, impressing yeah. men. We talked all about our first conversation was on the War of 1812, wasn't it? And how yeah. uh, eventually the United States was uh, had enough with, Amer with Britain. Um, really not playing fair on the high seas but other than that yeah internally yeah lots of new taxes so for example for example they put a tax on uh whiskey or on liquor a, a, a sin tax what today we'd call a sin tax hmm. um yeah lots of new taxes um uh through the stock exchange speculation that's another great uh u.s story it's a story of speculation hmm. capitalism really isn't it um investing money making something great from that investment and what you made what you created even if it's abstract is now worth more hmm. but you've, you've essentially made wealth yeah. in some way in some abstract way okay. and that it's not even always abstract is it you can invest in a construction company and then you build lots of properties and that's yeah. worth a lot more than the money that was originally invested. So yeah, your it happens. Assets. Yeah. Did, did Hamilton himself amass wealth, seek property, seek landing or anything, or he's just kind of this gentleman about town. Yeah. Like he, he has a nice bank account, but he doesn't have any estate himself. Did he pursue that? Yeah. Quick, quick, Question, a quick uh, a quick deviation on that then, on Hamilton's individual money issue. So he married. He had no money himself whatsoever, remember. He came from, from the West Indies, penniless, essentially. Mm -hmm. But he did marry into one of the wealthiest New York families. He was very, very lucky to do that. If he had one big break in his life was to catch the eye of George Washington, his other big break was to catch the eye of uh, apparently um, very attractive – but very rich heiress to a New York family. So he had money that way, um, but not endless money. Now, he, as I say, he was principled. He absolutely refused to take a penny in kickbacks, which was unusual, very unusual for the 18th century. It was sort of de rigueur, it was sort of normal 
um, you would enrich yourself a bit here and there, sort of definitely. Who wouldn't? Um, but he didn't at all. Absolutely refused to. Later, we'll get to it in a minute, but um, he was accused of embezzlement and things, but he didn't. He didn't take a penny. And in fact, when he practiced as a private lawyer before he before the Washington years and after he goes back after he's out of power, uh, he goes back to practicing law in New York. He he won't take more fees than he thinks is right. So people are like, this is the normal going rate for the job you've just done for me as a lawyer. And he's like, no, 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 it wasn't worth that much. I, I won't take, hmm. that's not fair. I won't take that off you. Hmm. And other times he would do work for free. Someone would come to him with a, a massive injustice, but they can't pay him. And he'd, he'd represent them anyway for nothing. Unheard of. Hmm. So yeah, his personal wealth, again, he never went hungry, not even close. He ended up having, I think, eight kids. They never went hungry. He looked to build a mansion for himself from scratch. So he was not poor, not close to being poor, but he never amassed a giant fortune. Okay. Deliberately, very, very deliberately, didn't line his own pockets when he could have and gotten away with it almost certainly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that's his, that's his story when it comes to money. So there, there's, um, so many, there's so many details to go into and, and it's impossible. We yeah. could probably do like a whole week's worth of episodes on this, but we can't do that right <laughs> now. So mm. just to kind of mm. kick the can further. So he has eight years yeah. in power. He does a tremendous yeah. amount. We could just do a whole episode it's just about what he accomplishes under Washington in those yeah. eight, eight years of power. But just to go forward, what's it like for him to lose power or to step back from okay. that into being a lawyer okay. again? Well, is, is he wounded so by that? Is he bruised by that? Or is that just the oh, way? Yeah, okay, and he's yeah. just fine with not being a king. No, he's one of those people who needs to be the most important man in a room. Especially when you've tasted real power. You've mm. been that, that guy at the tippy top, something like a prime minister, the second most powerful man in the country. And then you're out. You're in the political wilderness. Mm. Uh, didn't take kindly to that. Didn't like it. Uh, but there is, there is, sorry, before we go on to that, and we will go on to it, I just need to quickly tell you one other very important episode that happened to him while he was in power. Um, oh, I've got, a, sorry, I've got a very, very quick quote from Jefferson talking about New York uh, when they wanted to move the, the capital away from New York. He said, Jefferson said, New York, is a uh, New York City is a sewer containing all the depravities of human nature a world apart from small towns and the countryside where crime is scarcely heard of and breaches of order are rare and society, if not refined, is rational, moral and affectionate. I just wanted to set that up um, because that's how Jefferson views the North and big cities and people like Hamilton. And it comes into it. And now the other big event, the main sort of takeaway headline that has to be sort of quickly gone into i'll do it very quickly um is uh hamilton's infidelity one point is away at philadelphia for a year or more uh without his wife who lives in albany in in new york state um and a pretty woman comes to him and asks for some money to help her out and uh, he's taken in by her and they have an affair a dangerous liaison, uh, a sexual affair, <laughs> right? And uh, and the whole thing was a honey trap. The whole thing was a blackmail uh, scheme hmm. to to get him. Now he's not got so he's not he's not perfect. We keep talking about how he's all about honour and principles. Well, not when it comes to to ladies. He was uh, a, a philanderer. Um, later, it all comes out in the rock, in the wash, and I'll get to that. Um, but just to give you a quote, he said later when everyone knew, he said, my vanity led me to believe that she truly loved me. Her name was uh, Maria Reynolds, by the way, and this whole thing becomes known as the Reynolds affair. He said, my vanity led me to believe that she truly loved me. I've paid a higher price for my folly and can never think back on it without disgust and self-condemnation. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> Mary Gay. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Because her husband, she was married, and her husband goes to him and says, you know, I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut, but I need $1,000. And then a month later, I need another $1,000 or whatever it was. 
Now, people in Congress got wind of that and they thought they didn't they didn't know. They, they got wind that he was paying this guy, this random nobody, loads of money. They had no idea about Maria Reynolds and, and the sexual element to it. All they knew, they was pay, he was paying this, this random dude loads of money. They thought he was giving this guy money to invest on his behalf. Mm-hmm. Because as a Secretary of the Treasury, you weren't allowed to just play the markets necessarily. Well, mm-hmm. you weren't. It's a conflict of interest. But you could get somebody else yeah. to do it for you. Yeah. So they See, thought he was doing that. Nancy Pelosi, for example. She, exactly. does, it, she does it correctly. Yeah, well, yeah. She doesn't even try and hide it. Um, and they also thought that he was, he was stealing the money. He was embezzling that money from the Treasury or in some way illegally. And it wasn't. It was his own money. So is he anyway, sued? In the end. Do they prosecute well, him? Well, no. Or? No, no, because he hadn't actually done anything wrong other than wronging his own wife. He's yeah. wronged his own wife. But, the, the, but it comes out. So somebody brings a suit to him. If, but, they, they accuse him of that. And so there has to be a yeah, prosecution yeah. of some sort. Right. No. So what happens is uh, some leading congressmen go to him quietly because people still had some propriety back then. Hmm. They go to him quietly and they say, look, Alex, dude, we know... You're, you've embezzled money and you're and you're um, getting this guy to play the markets for you, right? And he was like, uh, no, I'm being blackmailed over a sexual affair. He just came clean. He just immediately came clean and he showed them all his letters, sort of love letters. He said, no, that's her what husband. He's blackmailing me over that. And, and they say, oh, all right. Um, well, that's unfortunate for you. Um, but you aren't actually breaking. It's unfortunate for you and your wife and your bank account. But um, there's, you know, we're not going to, it doesn't destroy your career. And in fact, we'll, we'll keep it quiet. Things like that were sometimes, sometimes people were more gentlemanly about things back then. And they're like, okay, well, 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 good luck. But, you know, we're not going to, uh, there's no court case for you to answer for embezzlement or anything like that. But this all comes back to bite him. So, that's all I need to mention the, uh, the, 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 the Maria Reynolds affair. So, yeah, George Washington decides there's no law saying you can only serve two terms, but he decides it would be wrong for anyone to serve more than two terms because then they would could be accused of being ambitious and want to become a king for life type of person. And that it was probably best if he just steps down. OK, uh, John Adams narrowly becomes the next president. He was vice president. He becomes president next. Now, John Adams was a federalist, so at least on paper, he was on board with, broadly speaking, with Hamilton's views on having a centralised government. But he wasn't anywhere near as hard line as uh, Hamilton. But they were, at least in theory, in the, pardon me, in the same party, mm-hmm. the federalist party. Jefferson is also out of the cabinet, and he is... Um, sort of biding his time, using that four years, because John Adams only is only president for four years, fails to get himself re-elected. Um, uh, for that four years, Jefferson's sort of fairly openly um, making it clear he's going to run for president next time round. Um, so, as I mentioned, Hamilton doesn't take kindly to being... Well, there's some line he says about how um, it's the lot of failed politicians or politicians who are in the political wilderness who are out of favor at least for the time being it's their lot to be gardeners and so here i am finding myself sort of pretending to be a gardener in my spare time Mm -hmm. um but he still does lots of writing goes back to law practices law to make money um and still writes a lot he still writes all sorts of political pamphlets and things now he and jefferson have been uh, our sort of arch enemies. This is sort of the main thing. This is, I think, probably one of the most famous things people know about Hamilton is that he and Jefferson are political, absolute political enemies. That's why we decided to do this conversation about Hamilton, isn't it? Because we did the conversation about Jefferson and towards the end, somehow I mentioned or talked about how if you like Jefferson, you hate Hamilton, at least on some level. And that's just really, that's just a really, really famous thing Hmm. that they, they hated each other. So a little bit about that. And like politically, though, or personally? It, but yeah, politically. Well, both in the end. In the mm. end, personally. Mm. But definitely politically. We've talked about the difference in opinion, the difference in view, world view, the difference in opinion about what America is or it should be between the Republicans, Jeffersonians, and the Federalists, Hamilton, Hamiltonians. Um, so I've got a couple of quick quotes here just to 
put it in sort of to make it extremely clear. Um, Jefferson uh, said, was asked, and when asked, said, uh, yes, I disapprove of his actions as the Secretary of the Treasury with his bank and funding system. He is recreating here the rottenness and corruption of England. So again, just basically exactly why we fought a war. Mm. It's exactly what we don't want. Um, Hamilton quite quickly, very quickly, really, realised that Jefferson was sort of now an implacable enemy. Because where I mentioned earlier, they had that that dinner table compromise Mm -hmm. over Assumption and the capital. They were sort of not friends, but they could work together at that point. Well, very soon, pretty soon after that, they realised they were sort of implacable enemies. Hamilton said, quote, "I I have now become convinced of several facts. Mr. Jefferson is the head of a faction hostile to me and my administration. He attacks the funding of the debt, the bank. I know that he has instituted a whispering campaign bent on subverting my projects. Hmm. So a whispering campaign is, you know, a a, a fairly quaint way of saying that he's just trying to build a coalition against you, basically. Kind of... of, um... What, Macbethian, kind of like a little, just an air of paranoia there. He knows that mm. he has power mm. and he's kind of clinging to it a little bit. Mm. 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 The, the people of the South, the people that want a smaller government, Jeffersonians, Republicans, again, nothing to do with the modern Republican Party. Uh, Republicans want, um, want a small government. They, they, they don't want a giant bureaucracy or uh they don't want industrialization they don't like cities they don't want urbanization they don't want a standing army and a, and a giant standing navy uh they they're suspicious of of central banks and high finance and and stock markets and stock exchanges people like jefferson thought that it was wrong to make money that way it was sort of morally wrong if you want to make money, go out and till a field. If you want to be a success, you want to make something, if you want to do something, go out and work the land. Go out and farm, raise cattle. You don't just speculate on the stock market, right? Mm. It's a fair, they, they are polar, polar opposite ways of looking at the world. Um, <laughs> So here's a little exchange of quotes between Hamilton and Jefferson, and I, I we'll move on from it at that point. Um, but I think this, again, is very, very revealing. It sort of says it all. Hamilton uh, said or wrote, um, it's the fanatical politics waged by Jefferson that threatens to disturb uh, the tranquility and order of our government. He is the real enemy of republicanism. So he's painting Jefferson there as, you know, it's really something quite bad. Wow. Jefferson responded by saying, I am not the enemy of the Republic. I am not part of that debased squadron plotting to change our Republic back into a monarchy. I am not a pimp whose stock dealers have corrupted Congress. I mean, it's strong words, isn't it? Hamilton again, I now consider it my duty to lift the curtain and show the world that it is he who is determined to destroy the credit and the honour of the nation. He, wow. he sees Jefferson as a, a demagogue someone that whips up the normal people, perhaps into a mob, perhaps into a frenzied mob. Jefferson responded, I will not have my reputation slandered by a man who history, from the moment history stooped to notice him, is a fabric of machinations against the liberty of this country, a country which not only received him as a penniless immigrant and gave him food, but now heaps honours on his head. It's really quite heated. They would get papers, newspapers, to just write hit pieces on each other. Yeah. Sort of endlessly. Wow. Just trying to slur. Each it's other, just like to modern each American reputation. politics. Yeah. Like you're a fascist. Right, yeah. yeah. A lot of the you're founding communist. fathers yeah. had the idea that 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 the leaders, the political leaders of of the nation, would be higher minded noble gentlemen, and it should never, would never really descend into a slanging match. Because we're too good, we're too high-minded for that. Well, that went out the window almost straight away. <laughs> and it got so bad that George Washington, it was damaging George Washington's ability to govern. Um, he thought even it would, it would rip the republic apart. George Washington said this, quote, There must be some harmony in my cabinet. 
differences of opinion are, are unavoidable, of course, and to a certain extent, they may even be a good thing. But can't we discuss these things without each of you attacking the motives of the other? You are both men of discernment, triad patriots, and yet without more charity to each other's views, I cannot manage the reins of government. Uh, and we shall inevitably be torn asunder. I don't see how the union of the states can be preserved. So at that point, when Washington starts ma making noises like that, both men sort of chill out a little bit, you know, for the sake, for the good of the nation and, and for the for their respect for Washington, who's getting on now. You know, he's no spring chicken. He's, he's old. Um, so in order that Washington doesn't lose his mind and the Republic be destroyed, they sort of calm down a bit to some degree, just keep it under wraps. But by the age of John Adams and when Jefferson himself is making a run for for power, it, you know, it's no holes barred, really, mm -hmm. by that point. Um, and so, so does Hamilton get back in power again before his untimely demise? No, no, um, no. So what happens is... He, by the time it comes to the next, the next general election, when, uh, which is 1800, the sort of fairly famous election of 1800, this has been poured over by historians so much, the election of 1800, when Jefferson gets in uh, to become the third president. Hamilton is disgraced by that point. So this is what happens. Um, where he becomes sort of no holes barred, the Jeffersonians hear of or are aware of the Maria Reynolds affair. And they're like, well, we're going to publish that then. You know, if it's no holes barred, if this is, if this is how it's going to be, if it's prison rules now, <laughs> then yeah, we're going to out you as a, as a cheater, as a, as a, an, an adulterer. So that's what they do. They get a paper to print all the details of it. And, um, the way Hamilton responds to that is to go sort of a full hangout. He says, yes, I did that. He didn't, he doesn't, well, he doesn't lie. He, he doesn't want, he doesn't like to lie. So his way of dealing with that is just to come out completely clean and said, yes, this is exactly what I did. I'm guilty of this 100%. You know, I'm sorry. I'm contrite. I wouldn't do it again. I'm full of self-reproach and self-condemnation, as he said. Uh, but yes, it's true. And he goes further. He like he writes like like a fifty page treatise about it. <laughs> um and I think he even publishes excerpts from some of his love letters with her and stuff. Wow. He goes way too far. <laughs> way too far. It, it's like he completely destroys well, it destroys his political career, basically. Um hmm. uh, when, when Jefferson and his acolytes and his followers get wind that this is how Hamilton's dealing with it. They're over the moon. They're like, great. That's the end of him, essentially, as a real force to be reckoned with. Um, because it's still the 18th century. Well, 1800. It's the end of the 18th century, early 19th century. You can't really get away with that. It, it, you know, it's not like Bill Clinton or Obama. Like, yeah, I cheated, but so sue me. No, no, no. Your reputation is destroyed. Um, well, one thing, just quickly to say before I carry on, his wife sort of forgave him f effectively. She didn't leave him, put it that way. Um, but yeah, that's how Hamilton deals with it, which is kind of crazy. Hmm. Um, well, what does and, he do? How does he pick his reputation up, the pieces of his reputation? Well, he doesn't really. I mean, well, he does to a, to a degree, but not never entirely. Hmm. Never entirely. Well, because he'll always still be that guy that was the most powerful man in the country for nearly eight years. He'll still be a war hero. He'll still be the great Hamilton on some level. He just can't be the leader of the Federalist Party. Yeah. He's not president material. He's yeah. still a great man. He's still a genius. But he's not president material now. Mm. It's like that. It's more mm. like that. Mm -hmm. So he's not gone. He's not ostracized. He's not like no one will ever publish anything he ever says ever again. It's not like he can't still be a lawyer, any of that. But he... He can't be president. That's not going to fly. So, so uh, he has a fallout. It's starting to get towards the end now here. Um, there's a fallout <clears throat> he has with John Adams, the, the sitting president. 
<coughs> for me. <coughs> they beg your pardon. Um, he has a big fallout with 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 uh, John Adams. A war starts. Well, they they're worried. England and France go to war. It's in the, the Napoleonic era. England and France are at war. Uh, the United States are worried that they might have to go to war with France. They're worried, basically, Napoleon will inf- invade the United States. And it's not a completely insane fear. In hindsight, it kind of is. It looks like it's. But at the moment, uh, uh, in the, in the when you're in it, it, w- it wouldn't have seemed that crazy. Like he sent over a massive expedition force to the West Indies. Um, uh, so anyway, we know he ends up just selling Louisiana to Jefferson a few years later. But so anyway. Where Hamilton is an army man, he's made a general. So where they haven't got a standing army, they decide, uh, John Adams and the Congress decide, we need an army, again, real quick, as soon as possible. And old George Washington is still alive. We'll offer him the command. He accepts it, even though he's, he's old, he's close to death, but he's the obvious choice. So when George Washington becomes Generalissimo, the, the highest commander of the army again. He he can pick who he wants to be his generals and his colonels. He picks Hamilton to be a general. And it sort of has to be green lit by um, John Adams. Uh, but it kind of has no choice. You can't really say no to Washington. Um, yeah, so so that, that's what happens. There's a quote here from Hamilton, uh, sorry, from John Adams where he says, um, sorry, just let me find it. Uh, Yeah, John Adams said, he, Washington, is cramming Hamilton down my throat. I'm compelled to appoint the most restless, impatient, artful, unprincipled intriguer in the United States to the commander of an army. (laughs) Because... um, well, I've said a few times, Hamilton's completely bullheaded. He won't let anything stand in his way. There's a quote I read earlier where he said exactly that. I won't let any obstacle stand in my way. Well, that's okay if you're in the command of an army and you can just fire off orders and nobody's got any choice. Anyone below you's got no choice but to follow it. Well, politics is different. Hmm. He goes to John Adams, who's president. He goes to him once he becomes a commander, once he becomes a general in the army. He literally goes into his office and start sort of berating John Adams, saying, I need this, I need that. We need to uh, make a formal treaty with the English. We need, to, we need to pull the trigger first on France. We need to go to war with France. I need a navy. I need loads more men. I need loads more money for all, all sorts of things. And John Adams basically says something like, I disagree with everything you just said. <laughs> I, I don't agree with anything you're saying to me right now. And the way they are, the way politics was back then, the way Hamilton is, he's a very proud man. They d- they just become political enemies at that point. They're just now enemies. They're as much enemies as Jefferson and Hamilton. Hmm. Despite the fact that John Adams is a federalist, he's, they're supposed to be on the same page. Um, they're both the leaders of that movement, of that party. Again, it's not a modern political party, but if, the, if you want to call it the Federalist Party, they're the two leading lights in it. Absolutely, they're now they're now political enemies over that. Hmm. Um, so, um, so John Adams then signs a peace with Napoleon, and the whole sort of storm in a teacup is over. Hamilton remains a general for a while actually and you're allowed to call yourself a general even after you're retired um so for the rest of his life he hasn't got that many years left um he's got about four years left of life um he, he he's known as general hamilton from that point on even though there isn't really an armor isn't he isn't a general necessarily of of a standing body of men or anything so what hamilton does now now he's already been disgraced really by the uh the reynolds affair and that was the point, actually, when everyone's abandoned him in the height of the Reynolds affair. George Washington sends him a silver bowl. It's not worth all that much money, but it's a sign of saying, I'm still, I still absolutely back you. In fact, he sends a note with it saying that, saying, I don't care really what you've done in this Reynolds affair. You will always have my trust and backing and my affection, no matter what, really. 
but then what soon after this around this period washington dies of old age um hmm. and um hamilton says he's absolutely heartbroken really by that and his greatest political ally because as the reti- even a retired the first president washington is just considered a, a titan of the political world you know like an an elder statesman like retired presidents now they've still got a fair amount of sway if they want to if they want to wield it what their their word still has holds a lot of weight uh, certainly the case of course the case with George Washington but now he's out of the picture that's Hamilton's greatest defender and ally gone hmm. so with the death of Washington and the Reynolds affair and his break with John Adams he's really in the political wilderness now so what he decides to do next is right a, a polemic absolutely destroying John Adams's character oh. and career yeah he, he's bitter he's really bitter so he basically um, hands power over to his greater political enemy to smite his lesser political enemy that's basically what happens well yeah, yeah that yeah. Uh, that yeah. could be construed as uh, defeating Adams or keeping uh, cock blocking yeah. Adams from the second term yeah, absolutely. He absolutely cock blocks Adams from getting a second term. Absolutely does that. He says, well, he basically kills the Federalist Party, his hmm. own baby. His own project is the Federalists. They they never have another president. The Federalist Party, no. in inverted commas, um, is no more after Adams. Um, so, yeah, he, he yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, but his, while he was in power, all the machinations and his designs for the United States eventually do win out. Well, yeah, in the end, yeah, yeah in the I'll end. Sort of, if, yeah. if I can, I'll, I'll end on that that point. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So he ends up winning, if you want, in the end, in terms of sort of world views or the view on what America is or should be. Um, one other quick thing, I think a couple of great quotes here. Um, just before the Napoleonic era, just before, um, there's the French Revolution. And just like Burke um, or Fox looked on the events of the French Revolution very differently, it's almost like they're looking at two different things. Jefferson and Hamilton looked upon it very different, differently. Jefferson said this about the French Revolution. He said, quote, they have been awakened, the French people, they have been awakened by our revolution. They feel their strength. Their lights are spreading. He thought it was a great thing just to behead the king. Um, and and if there's some anarchy or, or thousands of innocent people getting guillotined, well, that's one of the prices you might have to pay. Whereas Hamilton said of the French Revolution, how could our people embrace the most cruel, bloody and violent event that ever stained the annals of mankind? It is a monster born with teeth. <laughs> Well, as a as a Burkean, or at least a lukewarm Burkean as myself, I agree with Hamilton on that one. Um, but that just again just gives you one more flavour of the of the two men. Um, mm. Another quick thing before we start sort of rounding it off, um, a great quote here where he talks about slavery, he, where he'd seen the horrors of slavery um, growing up in the in the Indies. There's a great quote from when he was in the political wilderness after the Washington years. He founds the Manumission Society, by an, an organisation dedicated to freeing the slaves, uh, an abolitionist society. He said, quote, the disadvantages of slavery are obvious. The institution relaxes the sinews of industry, clips the wings of commerce and introduces into, into society misery and indigence of every shape. Um, so there you go. It was ma- ma- mainly from a sort of money point of view but um, mm-hmm. he was against it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, he was actually against it on humanitarian levels as well. He's, he said that he thought uh, there was lots and lots of human potential is just completely wasted by slavery. Um, so, mm. yeah. Um, so is, should we get uh, start sort of wrapping up with the events of, of uh, Jefferson's uh, presidency and, and Hamilton's death? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Adams never forgave Hamilton after he sort of ended his career, basically. 
character assassinated him in words. Adams said of him, uh, he is an underhanded intriguer, a man devoid of any moral principles, a bastard, a foreigner, a creole. Very, very rude hmm. thing to say. <laughs> did um, did uh, Jefferson and, and Hamilton make up? Oh, no. No. Oh, good God, no, no. No, no. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely loathe each other. Although... What happened was when it became clear that the Federalists, whoever was leading them, it certainly couldn't be the sort of utterly disgraced Hamilton. And it wasn't going to be Adams because, well, because of the Alien and Sedition Act and Adams's presidency was a bit of a failure in a few different ways. And um, and it ha it didn't look like Adams, and it was the case, had any real chance of getting reelected. So whoever ran for the Republicans was was going to be the next president sort of almost certainly and it was the case people knew it ahead of time and that was how it played out now the two leading lights are of course jefferson of course you know he he, he wrote he wrote the declaration of independence and uh, not entirely on his own but you know he is an absolute giant of the political stage jefferson so obviously him and the second most important person in, in, in the, the Republican movement was Aaron Burr. Um, now, everyone thought that probably Jefferson was a, a shoe in How could Jefferson lose to Aaron Burr? Um, but in the end, just a little tiny bit of a spoiler alert, it was very, very close. In fact, it was a tire. You know how it works. You have uh, electors, um, you, you know, everyone votes but then um it's the number of electors that each candidate gets then you become president so that was a tie between aaron burr and uh, jefferson so it went to the house of congress to vote on it that was a tie so the election of 1800 between burr and um jefferson was the closest run election you could possibly get um, anyway, in the run up to it, Hamilton, because this story is about Hamilton, Hamilton realizes that, like everyone else, that you've got a choice between Aaron Burr and Jefferson. And he hates Jefferson, of course, um, but he hates Aaron Burr more. <laughs> hmm. He said this. Hamilton said, if there, if there be a man in the world I ought to hate, it is Jefferson. But Burr has absolutely no morals, private or public. He listens to nothing but his own ambition. And that is, seems to be quite fair. Everyone seems to be in agreement, apart from the most people that absolutely love Aaron Burr. Not, not that there's all that many then or now. Um, but there are some. Um, most people say Aaron Burr was just completely ambitious. He was out for Aaron Burr, first and foremost. Everything he did and said was to further his career and nothing else. He, you know, I didn't really necessarily care about how well the United States did, whether it flourished or whether it grew or whether it was happy, as long as he got to be numero uno. Mm. Um, in fact, here's another quick quote. Um, mm. uh, Hamilton said, Here is a telling incident. When I headed the Treasury, he criticised me for not using my power to alter the government for my own advantage. I told him I could never do such a thing in good conscience. Conscience, Burr replied, great souls do not worry themselves with little details. Can you imagine such a man holding the power of the presidency? End quote. So that gives you a flavour for Burr. So, mm. um, so Hamilton uses the power of his pen and his voice to sort of ultimately advocate for Jefferson. He said, quote, Jefferson has a tincture of fanaticism, it's true, he is much too earnest in his democracy, crafty, not too scrupulous in politics, and he is not very mindful of the truth. In short, he is a contemptible hypocrite, but but he is as unlikely as any man I know to compromise. Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> but he is as likely as any man I know to compromise. Oh. That's a compliment um, to say that he would compromise. That's a compliment because um, politics is the art of compromise to get things done. Um so, so there you go. Jefferson wins. 
it's just by the slimmest possible margins. In fact, some say it's Hamilton um, talked to a few specific congressmen, sort of cajoled them, bullied them to change their vote over to Jefferson just to make sure Burr didn't, didn't win. But now, as you can imagine, Burr and Hamilton are the most, arch, politically speaking, the most arch enemies you could possibly have now. <laughs> they really, they really, really hate each other. Aaron Burr, a uh, couple of years in, he becomes vice president because the way it worked back then, whoever came second in the election gets to be vice president. It's not like how you have now where you have a, a ticket and you run on a ticket of president yeah. and vice president. Yeah. Um, yeah, so whoever came second got to be vice president. So Aaron Burr was vice president. Um, uh, a little later, I think it, was, was, it must have been just into Jefferson's second term, because um, I think Aaron Burr was trying to run to become governor of New York. Is that right? Anyway, by 1804, um, Hamilton and Burr are still talking trash about each other, like at dinner parties and in print and things. And um, at one particular dinner party, Hamilton was apparently just talking loads of trash about Aaron Burr. And there was a reporter there. And the reporter wrote it down, uh, you know, um, published it. Uh, which wasn't anything new. But, you know, there's certain levels you don't go beyond, you know. There's certain certain things you won't... You, you, don't, you don't go too far. You don't, you know, you don't say the absolute worst things. You know, you, you can't accuse people of breaking laws or things. You know, that's actual um, liable or... Um, yeah, so there's only Defamation, certain things. Yeah. Defamation, right, right. But this in this uh, article... It was said, and this is a quote, that Mr. Hamilton expressed, quote, a still more despicable opinion of Burr. Now, when Burr hears this, and he's had enough of it, he's getting sick of Hamilton. It's been years now. Burr sort of sends a letter to Hamilton saying, what despicable things? Like, what, you, what have you been saying? Like, I, I need to know. I sort of demand satisfaction. And Hamilton says... Um, like tries to brush it off. Says, "Don't don't worry about it. I don't need to tell you anyway." And 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 Hamilton and, and then Burr says, "Well, um, I won't I won't be besmirched like this. I won't have my honour impugned like that. Um, I, I I offer you a jewel. Um, I'm just not going to have it." And now jeweling. I could spend ages talking about this, but very quickly because I know it's taken up so much of your time. Um, I mean, we have been going on for quite a long time. Um, <laughs> nearly there. Jeweling <laughs> um, was illegal, um, but f s sort of allowed sometimes, sort of. So in New York, it was sort of strictly illegal, and you would be prosecuted almost certainly for doing it. In New Jersey, not so much. You could sort <laughs> of get away with it. You'd probably still be in a bit of trouble, but you probably wouldn't be prosecuted for it. And by this point, by the early 19th century, dueling is sort of very stylized. Um, it wasn't like both men were trying to kill each other. Hardly ever. I mean, sometimes it was. But usually what it was, it was a mechanism to save face. One man insults another, and where your honor was at stake, you offer the other guy a jewel. He accepts it because he can't turn it down. You have a jewel in inverted commas, but at the very last moment, one guy apologizes or says some words that are just sort of considered just about an apology. Both sides back down and everyone's cool and nobody's lost any honor. And, uh, and that's how it was often dealt with. Or you'd have a jewel and one guy, the guy that was in the wrong, that everyone usually knew one guy would be in the wrong, who did the insulting in the first place. He would, he would fire his gun in the air. Uh, effectively saying I concede so it doesn't even have to say I'm sorry or I take it back or anything it would, it would just be played out like that it was very rare, quite rare that you end up actually shooting each other dead in fact actually very very quick side note um, Hamilton's eldest son a, a Philip uh, who's a young man a couple of years before this had got himself into a duel and been killed because it is still dangerous. If one of the parties does want to shoot you, 
He doesn't want to shoot into the air. He won't accept your last second apology. No, he's going to he's going to aim his pistol actually at you and fire. He, he can. That's sort of it, he still can do that if he wants to, although it very rarely happened. So hmm. over this quote, a still more despicable opinion. Um, Burr offers Hamilton to a duel. Hamilton. So in, in sometimes, quite often, in fact, at that point, someone will back down. We go, oh, he's deadly serious, sort of deadly, really deadly serious. Oh, OK, well, I apologise. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to duel with you. Come on, get real. It's, it's, it's 1804. Who duels anymore? <laughs> it's not the 15th century. No, I'm not going to duel you. Yeah, uh, oh, I'm sorry then. All right, I'll take it back. Whatever. Don't be silly. But Hamilton is an extremely proud man and takes his honour very, very seriously to the point where he was first to storm a redoubt in war when he didn't have to. That's how serious his sort of personal, manly, physical honour is to him. So he can't decline, he feels, he cannot decline Burr's offer to Jewel. And so he doesn't. And so Burr's like, OK, OK, we're dueling, fine. And then so neither, neither man backs down. There's a quote here, Hamilton said, quote, I have known for a long time that my life must inevitably be exposed to that man, meaning Aaron Burr. The duel cannot be avoided. Hmm. My ability to be useful in public affairs depends on how men of character regard me. All consideration of what men of the world call honour impresses upon me the necessity to answer this challenge. So, um, yeah, he... They, they have they have a jewel and if anyone knows the story it, it doesn't end well for for Alexander Hamilton so they um, go off to New Jersey his, though yeah 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 they cross the Hudson just just a short jump across there to New Jersey and duel with pistols at 10 paces with seconds and the whole nine yards there's a whole thing about duelling it's all very as i say sort of very stylized um he did write a letter to his wife saying this because some you sort of expect that there's a possibility you're going to die you could totally die today this morning you could die but you're probably not going to you're probably not going to apparently he even made some arrangements later in the day some sort of work arrangements so he, nevertheless despite that he also wrote a letter to his wife should he be killed and he wrote this Quote, this letter, my dear Eliza, uh, will not be delivered to you unless I shall first have terminated my earthly career, as I humbly hope from redeeming grace and divine mercy, a happy immortality. If it had been possible for me to have avoided the interview, i.e. the duel, uh, my love for you and my precious children would have been alone a decisive motive. But it was not possible without sacrifices which would have rendered rendered me unworthy of your esteem again it's, it's honor it's all about honor um i need not tell you of the pangs i feel for the idea of quitting you and exposing you to the anguish which i know you would feel nor could i dwell on the topic uh, uh, nor could i dwell on the topic lest it should unman me i mean i can't even think about leaving you because hmm. I'll, I'll start crying basically is what that means um and then he finishes <clears throat> the consolidations of religion, my beloved, can alone support you, and and these you have the right to enjoy. Fly to the bosom of your God and be comforted. With my last idea, I shall cherish the sweet hope of meeting you in a better world. Adieu, best of wives and best of women. Embrace all my darling children for me. Ever yours, A.H. So, uh... Yeah, it's quite sad, really, because, you know, he, he sort of got his, his guts blown out. Well, they have a duel. He fires into the air. He told everyone beforehand, I'm going to fire into the air. There's no way I'm going to try and kill Aaron Burr, especially since I actually probably did insult him first. <laughs> I'm going to fire into the air, so everyone knew that. Aaron Burr, so he does. The accounts differ on exactly the second to second how it played out. Most people said one man fired before the other momentarily. But whatever happened, Aaron Burr wasn't struck. And Hamilton got a, 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 a ball in the hip or in the abdomen, just above the hip. Um, and it sort of goes, rips through his liver. So that's fatal right there. And then into his spine, 
So he actually lives for another 30 odd hours. He lives for like a day and a bit afterwards. But it's clear it's almost immediately that it's a mortal wound. Um, and so that's how that's how he ends. Right. Crazy. I mean, what a life. <laughs> he, <laughs> he was killed in a duel with Aaron Burr, the ex vice president um, over something he didn't he may or may not have said at a party one time. Mm. And um, was, so anyway. was Burr satisfied by that? Um, well, it, well, sort of. Well, it's difficult to say, but to begin with, well, he obviously absolutely meant to do it. He absolutely meant to strike, to hit Hamilton when he fired. Um, and for the rest of his life, and he lived for quite a long time after he wasn't all that old, um, he never apologized for it. He never said, you know what, that was a mistake. Uh, I really shouldn't have done that. I feel sorry I left his wife and kids fatherless. Never said anything like that. <laughs> so, but it ruined his career, absolutely ruined his career. Um, Jefferson was like, was like, oh my, like, oh my God, really? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That just happened. <laughs> um, of course, Aaron Burr, like, get out of my sight. I don't, I, I'm not giving you a position in cabinet ever again. I, I like I'm, I'm appalled by you. Um, so yeah, Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr actually went on to have a fair few different political adventures and physical adventures himself after that. But um, he's got a very interesting life. Um, but yeah, so that's how Hamilton died. But I wonder if I could uh, just take up a tiny bit more of your time, do a couple more reasonably uh, long quotes, well, a paragraph or two, hmm. and then I think that we could. Um, see us out would that would that be all please, right please yeah have you got any questions or anything no this is a wonderful i've been story. talking without interruption for quite a while now you brought the goods Sorry? bo okay cool well there's a book by um ron Chernow. um it's considered sort of the best biography of uh hamilton mm -hmm. um it's 700 pages long it's a bit of a tome um but it's absolutely brilliant if anyone wants to read more about the life of Hamilton. This is the book, Ron Chernow, and it's just called Alexander Hamilton. Um, so I've got three three quotes here. He wrote, "Few figures in American history have aroused such visceral love or loathing as Alexander Hamilton. To this day, he seems trapped in a crude historical cartoon that pits Jeffersonian democracy against Hamiltonian aristocracy." For Jefferson and his followers, wedded to their vision of an agrarian Eden, Hamilton was the American uh, Me Mephistopheles. It's difficult to say that. <laughs> Mephistopheles, who is a, 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 a demon, a devil. Mm -hmm. Mephistopheles. Uh, the proponent of such devilish contrivances as banks, factories and stock exchanges. Uh, they demonized him as a slavish pawn of the British crown, a closet monarchist, a Machiavellian intriguer, a would-be Caesar. Noah Webster contended that Hamilton's, quote, ambition, pride and overbearing temper had destined him to be the evil genius of this country. And then uh, Chernow goes on to say, Hamilton's powerful vision of American nationalism, which... Uh, which states subordinate to a strong central government and uh, led, led by a vigorous executive branch, aroused fears of a reversion to royal British ways. He seemed, uh, he seemed solicitude for the rich causes, critics to wait. Sorry, oh sorry, his seeming solicitude uh, for the rich and caused critics to portray him as a snobbish tool of plutocrats who was contemptuous of the masses. Uh, for another group of naysayers, Hamilton's unswerving faith in a professional military converted him into a, into a potential despot. Uh, from the first to the last words he wrote, uh, uh, from the first to the last words he wrote, Hamilton wrote, concluded historian Henry Adams, again, Hamilton saying, I read always the same Napoleonic kind of, of adventurism. Sorry, that's Henry Adams saying that. Henry Adams, the historian, says there's something of the Napoleon about, about Hamilton. Um, and then finally Chernow goes on to say, even some historians uh, admired, uh, even some of Hamilton's admirers have been unsettled by a faint tincture of something foreign in his West Indian transplant. Woodrow Wilson begrudgingly pra praised Hamilton as, quote, a very great man, but not a great American. <laughs> 
some people absolutely hate Woodrow Wilson, don't they? So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, penultimate quote here. Um, for all of his superlative mental gifts, he was affi- afflicted with a touchy ego that made him querulous and fatally combative. He never outgrew the stigma of his illegitimacy and his inquisitive tact often gave way to egregious failures of judgment. I think maybe he's talking about the Maria Reynolds affair affair there Um, and left even his keenest admirers aghast. Perhaps they're talking about when he went after John Adams there, even his own admirers were like, you've gone too far there. Like, what are you doing? You've just destroyed the Federalists. You've just destroyed yourself. Hmm. Um, Chernow goes on. Um, If capable of numerous close friendships, he also entered into into titanic feuds with Jefferson, Madison, Adams, Monroe and Burr. Oh, yeah, he also completely fell out with Madison and Monroe. He's a difficult man to like, it seems. Um, (laughs) The magnitude of Hamilton's feats as Treasury Secretary has overshadowed many other facets of his life. Clerk, college student, youth, youthful poet, essayist, artillery captain, wartime adjutant to Washington, battlefield hero, congressman, abolitionist, Bank of New York founder, state assemblyman, member of the Constitutional Convention and New York Ratifying Convention, orator, lawyer, polemicist, educator, patron saint of the New, of the New York Evening Post, foreign policy theorist and major general in the army. Boldly uncompromising. He served as catalyst for the emergence of the first political parties and as the intellectual fountainhead for one of them, the Federalists. He was a pivotal force in four consecutive presidential elections and defined much for America's political agenda during the Washington and Adams administrations, leaving copious commentary on virtually every salient issue of the day. So there you go. And there's one last thing to say. And it's that 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 question you mentioned about how he seemed to be a man ahead of his time or a man out of time or a man who seemed to maybe see the future, see how America went, that he ultimately won that contest of of vision hmm. between Jefferson and Hamilton, that he mm-hmm. sort of saw how America could go or was sort of inevitably going to go or sort of had to go down certain paths, mm-hmm. that he saw that. Um I mean, it, there's one last irony to mention that Hamilton becomes or is a champion for the elites, for the elitists, when he's this penniless hmm. bastard immigrant yeah. from the West Indies. Yeah. And he becomes a champion of the elites, of the elites. And Washington uh, and Jefferson is the man of the people. He He couldn't be more really, a voice of the common man. Mm-hmm. And yet he's a landed, wealthy uh, l- landowner, slave owner. Um, he was born to the purple. That's not right. He's not royal, obviously. But, you know, he was born into a, a fairly extreme privilege. And yet he becomes the man of the people. Yeah. There's, an, there's a very interesting irony there, which hasn't been lost on many historians. Okay, one last final quote, and then uh, we'll bring it to a close there. Thank you for your... Um, all your patience, Benjamin. You've been very, very, very patient. Wonderful. But I'd like to do Hamilton some justice, you know. Absolutely. He's one of the most important founding fathers. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave it with this, where um, uh, Ron Chernow says, quote, He was the messenger from a future that we now inhabit. We have left behind the rosy agrarian rhetoric and slaveholding reality of Jeffersonian democracy and reside in the bustling world of trade, industry, stock markets and banks that Hamilton envisioned. He has also emerged as the uncontested visionary in anticipating the shape and powers of the federal government. At a time when Jefferson and Madison celebrated legislative power as the purest expression of the popular will, Hamilton argued for a dynamic executive branch and an independent judiciary along with a professional army, a central bank, and and an advanced financial system. Today, we are indisputably the heirs of Hamilton's America, and to repudiate his legacy is, in many ways, to to repudiate the modern world. Hmm. End quote. Wow. Man ahead of his time. Yeah, I think so. For better or worse... Mm -hmm. He was, he sort of was a visionary. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't take that away from him. 
like I say, I'm much more uh, a Jeffersonian yeah. than I am uh, um, a lover of Hamilton. But you've got to give him credit for lots and lots of different things. Lots of different things. I don't think he would have been a, a particularly nice person to sit down and have a meal <laughs> with or have a, a, a drink with. I think he would have been, I think he was quite arrogant and conceited. Um, I would love to have sat down and have a conversation with Jefferson, you know. Uh, but there you go. If nothing else, he shaped history, he shaped the United States, arguably more than any other single person. So there you have it, the story of Alexander Hamilton. Bo, thanks again. This is a wonderful uh, continuing conversation we've had about uh, the founding of America and the, the building of it and how it's shaken out. And I just I totally appreciate your knowledge base and all the work that you put in. And it's just great storytelling, too. No, thank you for having me on. And if that if the last three hours hours haven't um, completely broken your will to have further conversations <laughs> with me, perhaps a few months down the line or sometime down the line, we'll we'll talk about one of the other founding fathers or one of the other presidents. If you've got any particular one you like, if you're oh, a big you, fan you of, you said something about um, Grant or something. You, um, yeah, yeah. You you raised your your you said something about Grant, and then you also said something about uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Like there's some, mm. there's a spark there, so maybe we can follow up with one of those guys. Grant is superb, absolutely superb. Uh, uh, very quickly to say, he was, you could say a bit of him that he went from rags to riches to rags to riches. Hmm. A absolute roller coaster of a life. Um, and uh, well, there's no time for this. I've taken up enough of your time. But um, Benjamin, thanks once again. All right, Bill. Have a good night, and I'll talk to you soon. You too. Take care.